Um, how would you, what does that mean to you as it relates to Microstoria? Well, so I, I put into this um, uh, business of giving voices to uh, the poly, what I call polyphonic and subjugated voices uh, when I, I started my doctoral studies. And um, I, I was uh, interested in, in what we call, they say, there is this new emerging discipline in strategy we call strategy as practice. Mm -hmm. right? Strategy as practice actually emphasizes uh, everyday situated activities, what people say they do, uh, and uh, the, the gap between that and what they actually do in practice. So in accounting for strategy, our the argument is, is, is that uh, organizations or people don't have strategy. They actually do strategy. Well, hello there. I am so happy to be publishing this, a long-awaited episode, episode 65 of the English Coach Podcast. And today I'm going to be talking with uh, a very old friend of mine, one of whom I'm very proud and I am honored to be still in contact. Now, truth be told, really quickly, I wasn't exactly in the best of moods over the past few days. We are now coming to terms with well, what still is the first wave of the second major crisis that we've had to deal with over the past two years. And, you know, I wasn't quite sure if it was appropriate, but in retrospect, and also after talking to a few friends of mine, maybe we do need uh, some positive kind of distraction from all the rubbish, pretty much, that is going on in the world right now. You know, sometimes I'm really disappointed with humanity and for that you know sometimes i ask myself the question you know what's the sense really when you know this kind of madness can actually take place you know what's the use but you know whatever the case um i'm thinking of the few fans that i might have out there the few listeners and um you know i'm happy to be able to put something out that offers you know, some positive vibes, some reassurance, and a little distraction from all the bad things that are happening in the world right now. My support also goes out to all those people who are suffering and displaced by the current events. And um, yeah, um, you know, in many ways I'm lost for words and I can't possibly understand what you're really going through at this point in time but um, the least I can do is uh, express my regards all right so now today we'll be talking about something that is it is actually quite relevant to what is happening now you know if you think of the stories of the smaller voices in society you know things like censorship independent media finding voice expressing yourself on a global scale and such the like it is definitely relevant and somehow parallel to what it is that we are experiencing today our topic for the day is Microstoria, and I was inspired to put together this episode after having listened to a lecture by a friend and colleague of mine, work colleague, um, also someone I studied with at some point in time a few years ago. And the topic is Microstoria, and Microstoria has to do with finding voice. And since I am myself an English trainer or a language coach, sparring partner, whatever you want to call it, this is what I do for a living. I help to give people voice or better put, I help people to find their voice, albeit in a foreign language. So I sensed a very strong parallel and I thought it proper to invite my friend to talk about this a little bit. Now... As I said, it's about finding voice, but we're going to be starting the show or the feel of the show at the beginning is going to be like a very human conversation catching up on old times that happens between friends. And, you know, at first I thought it was a little bit too much, but, you know, it's actually not 
too bad you know it's a natural process it's a natural thing that happens when two people who haven't seen each other for quite a long time come together and furthermore the conversations we have are also good examples of our experiences as foreign students in a foreign country so you might find it interesting you know it's a positive spin on everything and you know some people are interested to know what that is like what the experience was and in this case we talk about our learning experience in frankfurt oda which is the other frankfurt in germany sitting right there on the polish border and you know it's quite interesting you might be surprised uh as to the insights that come up it, it, it just gives you I, I call it additional options you know yes it does it yes does. it does but you know i mean options can also be a torture you know <laughs> yes i mean i have one cat in my house can you imagine if i had two Oh, please get one. Get, get it. <laughs> it would you, kill me in my sleep. You, you deserve it, but the would be very upset. Like. Now, after that, we go into the meat of the matter. And again, on the topic of Microstoria, we start by talking about strategy as praxis or strategy as practice. That was a little German there. Now, uh, sometimes we talk about strategies that we write on paper or we uphold as a kind of guideline going forward into the long term. However, you know, strategy is not only written, it is also done. Or you could speak of strategy in practice. And that is what we talk about first. After that, we, you know, divulge a little bit more on our experience or the experience of foreign students in a foreign country and then we talk a little bit about the idea of making your own stage uh, the the whole theme of this podcast episode is micro story finding voice taking voice giving voice and as an extension to that making your own stage i always say if you are or if you feel excluded from anyone's stage then you should make your own because you know you might not be invited to every stage and these days you know we have the means to make our own stages and you know um, do as i do with my podcast so we'll be talking about making your own stage and then we're gonna talk about what can happen the positive outcomes of what can happen with real examples from real life what can happen when you bend the rules and uh well you know not you know too deceptively or in too much of a bad way but sometimes bending the rules can have strategic impact even to the benefit of the company we then go on to talk about the voices on the ground as we put it and we look at exploring externalities which is sometimes the the small aspects that affect people on the ground you know we might have a wonderful plan a sustainability plan for example that we put together to help people in need and from our place our place of maybe privilege we think in our mind in our world the things that we put in place we think that they will work and we think that they will solve the problem however sometimes when you talk to the people who are really affected the people on the ground you know explore the externalities you might find that the situation is different we also go on to talk about some narratives that were common roughly 20 years ago like you know 20 years ago everybody was talking about globalization and a few years after that we were talking about sustainability globalization was um yeah you know popular you know it was a popular talk in 2020 and um you know it inspired some of us to study things like international business and um, then we moved on a few years after that people started talking about sustainability at the beginning of it many people didn't even have that in their mind they had absolutely no idea what that meant or what that could mean 
And、um, nowadays, it's commonplace to talk about sustainability. Everybody has an idea as to what that means. So it's also a reflection of how we have developed as people over the past few years. And who knows? You know, maybe you can gather something. From the experiences we've had, the things we've gone through, and、um, some of the things we share and what we've learned. All right. So I hope you enjoy the show. That was a quick rundown. Now you know what it's all about. You can decide now if this show or this episode is for you or not. All right. Whatever the case, I hope you enjoy the show. And without further ado, you, you get a point. So they are not getting jobs. But it appears when you look at the data and you see those black kids going to school, lots of them, you think, oh, they are doing well, and look, these people are being left behind. But the reality is,、um, they, they are going to school, but、uh, the black guy is still、uh, maybe ten times or five times more likely to be unemployed. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, I I don't really want to touch on that too much. I mean, that's that's, no, no, that's no. high politics. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, it's just. Is that the idea of microstoria is breaking down some of these broad narratives?、Mm-hmm. And, uh, until we break that down, obviously we all want everyone to have opportunity. David Sapong is professor of strategic management and head of the Strategy Entrepreneurship and International Business Research Group. He started his first degree in 2002 at the Europa Universiteit Viadrina. But left after his second year to continue at the University of the West of England, Bristol, where he received a first class in business administration. He then went on to complete a PhD in strategic management in 2010. An elected vice chair of the British Academy of Management, David serves on the council's subcommittee of academic affairs, of conference and capacity building. And is a former convener of the annual doctoral symposium of the academy, a senior visiting research fellow at the Higher School of Economics (HSC) Laboratory for Economic Innovation. David has since 2015 conducted research on Russia's basic research program on global competitiveness at the National Research University in Moscow. He is an associate editor for the Journal of Strategy and Management, and currently enjoys a visiting professorship at the Bristol Business School and an honorary research fellowship at the School of Management, IT, and Public Governance, University of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. David's research is practice and process oriented. And frequently draws on the Heideggerian Wittgensteinian approaches to social practices to engaging with cross-level management research problems. His research interests lie primarily in the broad areas of strategy and innovation, and his current research concerns relationalism and process theory, second-order technology and innovation management, strategy as practice, strategic foresight. And temporality, discursive practices, and the making of European cosmopolitan marketplaces. Methodologically, much of his work is qualitative oriented, and focuses on theorizing, organizing repertoires, performative routines, and how activities, dispositions, and choices get ordered over time to shape innovation. And strategy in organizing, he frequently employs microstoria, narratives, and publicly available archival datasets for his empirical inquiries. David has authored over 120 articles in refereed academic journals, international conference proceedings, and book chapters. His recent edited book on strategic foresight and innovation management was published by Reutledge in 2020. And his very recent papers have appeared in various outlets, including Work, Employment and Society, International Marketing Review, Economic and Industrial Democracy, Journal of Business Research, 
Technological Forecasting and Social Change, IEEE Transactions on Engineering Management, R&D Management, Technovation, International Journal of Production Research, Science and Public Policy, Journal of Technology Transfer, Scandinavian Journal of Management, Production Planning and Control, European Urban and Regional Studies, Environmental Science and Policy, Journal of Economic Issues, International Journal of Entrepreneurial Behavior and Research, and the International Journal of Human Resource Management. So then, without further ado, our guest for today, Professor David Sapong. Okay, David, finally, finally, I've managed to catch a little time, get a little time slot out of your busy schedule, sir. Now, hopefully, you're feeling refreshed somehow and um, ready to take on, you know, this little conversation that we planned on your topic, actually inspired by your topic of um, Microstoria. Are you ready? I do, I am. You are ready. Okay, fantastic. All right. Well, you know what? Um, Your topic, I had the privilege of um, seeing your presentation, your lecture on Microstoria, and I was very inspired by it. You know, I had lots of questions and... You know, I saw it immediately, you know, being the the media podcast opportunist that I am. I said, oh, my goodness, you know, I think this resonates with so many things that I sometimes talk to my students about and also the motivation behind why I do this podcast in the first place and so on. So, you know, I mean, the idea of finding voice, there seems to be a very strong parallel between microstoria and finding voice or giving voice to minorities of whatever form. Yes, and that is the topic that I put together. And hopefully we can, you know, discuss the parallels on that. Sure. You know, yes, yes, yes. I really, really appreciate it, man. All right. So, David, I mean, it's been a long time. Very long time. Very Very long time. time. We, yeah, man, we studied together and... It's fond memories, you know, fond memories, More David. Than a decade now. Amazing period, amazing time. Yeah, um, yeah indeed. <laughs> In, yes, yes, yes. But, you know, I have a small correction, though, for you, David. Yeah. You you mentioned that I'm, I'm teaching German. I'm not really teaching German. Yeah. Somet- <laughs> sometimes I get commissioned by a company or so to teach their staff. And if they have staff that, you know, is not... Um, native germans are are not native germans then i might find a german teacher for them yeah but i don't do it myself yeah but it's, it's yeah. incredible you know you, you look back some what was it it's almost 20 years now isn't it when we oh yeah Frankfurt and uh, uh the fact that we, we landed in the country without speaking a word of german mm-hmm. uh, the last time i had one of your podcasts and obviously um, the way you were speaking German, I, I was mm-hmm. I was very impressed. <laughs> you simply <laughs> well, sound like a native, and I'm like, oh, Ian is a native in Deutschland. <laughs> gone native, <laughs> gone native on the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, you know, I mean, I live here, and you know, it's also a show of respect. Yes. You know, I mean, I've had my difficulties with the language. Uh, we don't need to get into that today, but I've had my difficulties. But if I live here, I think I should speak the language, you know, show that respect, because I think learning a language and using it fairly correctly is showing that you do have some respect for the culture and the people. Actually, that is what was going through my head. Just ask myself whether potentially if I had stayed in Germany. Mm-hmm. What level would have my would my would have my language been by now? You know, it would have been but, good. Yeah, I thought I thought I thought I would, I would have probably done well. Um, yes, <laughs> of course. At the stream on the continuum, I was just thinking about the German society in itself, and mm-hmm. sometimes uh, we as Auslanders we can be a bit hard on Germans, you know, because they mm-hmm. also. Uh, well, present you as an Auslander, Auslander kind of stuff. Well, you know, they're hard on us too sometimes, <laughs> exactly. you know, to be and, fair. <laughs> and on reflection, I, I, I told myself, this is an incredible bunch of people. 
uh, mm -hmm. allowing us to come into their country to come and study without speaking a word of German. Mm -hmm. um, and they give us the chance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and you think about it, it tells you how warm these people are and mm -hmm. how open minded they are and mm -hmm. uh, how they believe in human potentialities that you can come in and learn the German language in a year or two. Uh, you can study in their language. This is just incredible. Um, yes. And because over here in England, um, um, sometimes when some of my colleagues are, 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 are being a bit picky when it comes to language, you know, we've got Chinese students and other students from the Arabic world. And uh, when someone is, oh, the essay is poor, the English. And, you know, you sometimes involuntarily you know you, you get into that conversation then after a second you know you, you just go no no th this is wrong mm -hmm. uh, when i went to germany you know and i wish when i went to germany i could uh, at least write like these people and thinking about me coming from ghana where we all using the same roman alphabets everything like the germans and english should have been much much you know easy and on that basis you should be very easy learning german mm -hmm. and how i struggle and these guys are coming from china they are coming mm -hmm. from the east and we should rather be praising them and of course yes. we should see them to be very very bold people having uh, made that journey so whenever mm -hmm. i'm marking scripts I'm, I'm very very lax when it comes to grammar you know mm -hmm. But the most important thing I want to see whether the person can, uh, you know, really explain whatever that she's saying. You know? But I'm not really like, you know, where is the grammar and you know, where is the pronoun and you know, all this kind of stuff. Because I, I know it is simply not easy. You have to be in another person's shoes, you know, to to really feel it. And 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 that is what I like about Germany. My experience in Germany is it shaped my life. It shaped my perspective and. It's giving me totally different perspective. You know, when I'm in class, you know, you, you're teaching other people from other parts of the world, and you you sharing their hustle, their their struggle, and um, some of them I, I see them and I ask myself, uh, this guy said to me, how is he coping? Has he even had lunch? Um, mm -hmm. Initially, oh, yeah. he had he has no money. Like how I don't have any money in Frankfurt, Oda, and. Mm -hmm. Nobody really understood it. Nobody knows what is going on in our lives. Your friends, you come to class and uh, they, they see us and they think it's as normal as them. You know? So whenever I see the international students here, you know, I've more or less gone native here now. So <laughs> you see them and you start to feel for them. Uh, there's been an occasion, yeah. I remember, I've invited two international students to my house uh, for mm -hmm. Christmas. It's just 2010, I'm just thinking, oh, these guys, where would they be going? One was from Saudi Arabia, then I've invited two Chinese to my house. And again, I, I you know, it's the same when we were invited by Amex. If you remember, there was this uh, uh, girl who was in the international business office. Annette, you know, yes, I remember her. Yes, 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 indeed. For, for uh, a Christmas meal. Yes, and some of these little things, they, they are so interesting, inspiring. And you, you look back and oh, I, I, I will never forget this. I, I used to tell my wife, I said, uh, it's one of the uh, darkest days in my life in Germany. You know, looking back when, mm -hmm. because I was new in Europe and um, I didn't know the European culture, you, you know, very little. Yes. As I said, yes, my, you, you and myself and... Uh, I actually got in there first before you came in. And I know. Yeah, I remember. Yes. Very mm -hmm. typical African. I just went mm -hmm. there empty-handed. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just went in there empty-handed. You know, sitting down. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you, you came in and you came with a bottle of wine. And oh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh well, th you remember that. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Because for us, when someone asks to invite you home, you, mm -hmm. know, you, you just don't know. You, you think, no, you've been invited. It, it's a totally different. I remember once this boy, what, uh, Pascal, you know, my, my friend Pascal. Yes, 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 it, I remember Pascal. Mm -hmm. Oh, David, I've got the girls. They are coming to my house. We are going to cook Nana and Diana. And do you mm -hmm. want to come along? And I said, well, yeah, 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 we're coming there. 
Again, I went in there empty <laughs> hand. He was very nice. You know, he was very nice. He didn't say anything. We had the mail, everything. Then he called me outside and said, Oh man, you know, you, everybody contributed something and you have to contribute something. And I don't have any money in my pocket. <laughs> I didn't know. And, uh, and uh, yeah, you think about all those kind of stuff and the extent to which you were tolerated, you know? Yes. How yes, I was tolerated, all oh, those kind of stuff. You, you look back and you think, this is interesting and these are humans. It's just, it's just incredible. Yeah, today when I when I see somebody in England here, a foreigner, or what somebody is doing something, I just laugh. It, it, it means absolutely nothing to me. You know clearly that he doesn't know. Um, it's like an Indian, right? Send you an email, you know, and the apologies. Oh, dear professor, and you laugh because over here you use your first name. You know, you supposed to call you just deaf. He didn't go, oh, hello, professor, or oh, dear professor. You just, oh, God. Yes, I feel strange when people call me Mr. Patterson. <laughs> I'm like, hello. <laughs> yes. Or in German, when when kids say to me, they come to me and they, they, they start talking to me with Z, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> No, 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 Z, please, please, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That it the, feels really I, strange. Yeah. yeah, that is the human experience. Those are some of my yeah. stories in, in Frankfurt Food that I like. I will never forget. You know, you, you look back, I feel, oh, what an embarrassment. But yes. but then I tell myself again, was it an embarrassment? No, I didn't even know what was going on. Then, well, mm-hmm. they could say whatever they wanted. I don't understand. <laughs> yes, yes. I reveled in my ignorance. And said, oh, that's fine. <laughs> well, you know, ignorance is bliss. And, you know, David, I tell you, you know, the, the intercultural or let's say the, the integration courses, you had the benefit of that. I, I think I missed my integration course. Oh, okay. I, I think I missed a whole semester. But, um, yeah, I was just I was just lucky, I guess. But you know, David, I also struggled. You know, I had to work. I had to work. I was lucky enough to get a work, a job in a, in a bar. Remember, I was working in this bar all the time. Uh, Hemingways. Yes, in Hemingways, <laughs> and um, you know, I got some other things that didn't quite work out as as well. But you know, I mean, yeah, that's that's just people are people everywhere, and if you don't know the culture then, you know, I mean, yes, they're tolerating foreigners, but, you know, in many ways, we also tolerate them, yeah. you know. Um, of course, we're thankful for, for you know, being tolerated and being accommodated, but in the same breath, you know, we did add a splash of color, a splash of internationalness oh, yes. oh, yes. oh, to, yeah. their, to, to, to the program and all of that. So, you know, I mean, just a, a sense of proportion here. And we were very it's, outgoing, it's warranted. Well, isn't it? We were quite outgoing. We we never um kind of um uh, kind of created a kind of a a group for ourselves or whatever. We we did it great well. We, yes, we, of course, of course, of course. It was good, you know. I mean, generally speaking, you know, you have had your bad experiences. I had a few as well. Generally speaking, it was a wonderful experience. Wonderful. And and, wonderful. and and who who I am today, yeah. I I I've also been shaped by 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 these experiences. You and, remember when uh, I moved to? I, I like who I am today. Yeah. You remember when <laughs> yes. I moved to? I moved to live in Poland. <laughs> I remember Schwabitze. <laughs> Schwabitze. It's one of the most amazing experiences whenever I meet a Polish person and I, I try to mm-hmm. speak my little Polish. They just yes. unbelieve it. And I tell yes, them, yes, yes. I live in Slobice, I've been to Janela Gora, mm-hmm. I've been to Gorzo, and uh, I was at Adam Mishkevich University. Yes, it, yes. And it's hey, quite exciting. <laughs> you know, David, I, I kid you not, just last night I watched uh, a film and it was filmed in, it was a crimi, crimi film, which is a, what do you say, a murder mystery film. And it was filmed in Frankfurt Oda and Schwobitze. Ooh, awesome. Yes, <laughs> yes, last night on TV. And last night on TV, I watched it. And today I was teaching this guy. He's coincidentally a professor just like you at uh, the University of um, Bremen. Well, as he's retired now, but he's at the music school, music school in Bremen. And he said he watched it as well. Wow. And uh, <laughs> during the whole program, they they, they, they shot scenes from Schwobitze. Yeah. Yeah. Looking into Frankfurt order. Yeah. And I could see the old Studentenwohnheim. So I could see where I was living across the bridge. 
yes, yes, yes. It's it was so quite quite an experience. But you know, it it, it's nice though that you 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 reflect on the good things about the the you know the the, the whole experience. Uh, many people want to say Frankfurt order. Uh, it's like when when people say Jamaica. They they immediately have this as these associations in Germany. When you say Frankfurt Oder, there are usually some funny associations as well. Oh, yes. But it was so nice to 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 have seen that film last night and you starting today with the good experiences. Oh yeah, when when of, I first um, I tell people when I meet in a German, I tell them, oh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm from Frankfurt, and they'll say, which Frankfurt? I say, oh, and the Oder, and they just can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you study at Frankfurt? I said yes. But yeah, you see, so it's not it's not us. It's it's it's, it's not us really. You know, some people I say Frankfurt and they don't even they don't even acknowledge the other one. Last, you know, during, yeah, uh, they had this uh, Africa European uh, Compass program in Berlin, mm -hmm. and I was invited by the government of Ghana. I was part of the panel, and uh, we had some students coming in there. And shockingly, one of those stood up. Uh, he was studying IBA. <laughs> really? <laughs> when I took the podium and I said, ah, I used to study at Everybody was shocked. But, mm -hmm. and, and this boy, after the program, I had a long chat with him. It, it was exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Quite exciting. I said, wow. Yes, of course, of course, of course. Well, you know, I had to finish up my studies somewhere else, you know, because um, even though, yes, I'm speaking German now, I did not pass the German. I think I needed one and a half points, and because yes, you know, I had to, I had to change. I had to change universities because I, you know they got they got tough on me. I was lucky. I I I and, got, um, I through and I left. There was no way I was going to pass. Well, yeah, that's your yeah yeah. Your, your strategy was good. I think you suggested to me to do what you did, but um, you know, I. I chose to express a certain loyalty, and loyalty is a good thing. But in that case, it didn't really mm -hmm. help me, you know. But um, I, I did manage to finish at another university here in Berlin because everything was recognized. But I did lose about two or maybe even three years of my life because yeah. of uh, the German test. Yeah, it's just incredible. Yes, yes, yes. So you know, um, that that's still that is still um, a, a painful memory, but. Um, you know, it's just it's just all in the game, you know? Yes, yes. actually, it's the same with me. When I came here, I, I was very worried um, because the first year when I came, I ended up in a factory. <laughs> Working, I didn't uh, go to school because I, I couldn't afford the fees of the it was around seven grand at that time. Um, yes, yes. So I worked for a year. Then when I went into join the third year, my only consolation was I looked back and what I realized was that most of our colleagues, Pascal, all the guys, they had one of the a, a year abroad, if you remember. So yes, yes, yes. A year abroad. So when I was in my final year, they were now returning. Yes. So when they were in a year abroad, I was in a factory, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. working there. You <laughs> return. So we all come yes. at the same time. So I thought oh, that's that's a bit of a consolation. Mm -hmm. And then that it can be painful, you know. Seeing your colleagues um, finishing the program, and, and obviously you know they are no better than you, and because you find yourself in this weird circumstance, you know, it's mm -hmm. incredible. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it's incredible. Really. Yes, yes, yes. As a, well, you say they were no better than you. You know, maybe I mean, you know, I mean, it, that's a hard, kind of hard way to put it. Mm. But um, you know, I mean, it, let's just say. You know, it's their country, you know, and, and they naturally they enjoy privileges that we're not even aware of. Mm. Yes. And, mm. and also the, the, the language situation. Um, now I know that now I know the value mm. of it. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, um, now I know. Mm. Yeah. So, you, wish, you know, imagine if you were not going to FFO to start your, your studies. How <laughs> how? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't think about that. I try not to regret anything. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's some, there are few things that I would have probably done differently. Yes, but I, I try not to dwell on that any, you know, anymore. And, I, I, uh, I, I, I do reflect. Uh, when I came to Berlin, I had to meet uh, Professor Zona mm -hmm. because I had recommended uh, a PhD student to him, and uh, this world guy was amazing. He, he's actually now working at Nottingham Trent. So, uh, yeah, I met with Professor Zona. We wanted to do some projects together, and we had uh, lunch and coffee in Berlin. And 
it was quite surreal, you know, looking back. Ooh, some 10 years back when I came in here and I graduated, this was a, a big professor, you know. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Today we, we're sitting as colleagues and we, we're talking about what we could do together. And it's incredible, incredible. Yes, yes, yes. You know, this is how the cookie crumbles. Yes, yeah. you know, things, things change, uh, things change. Have you yes. ever heard of uh, where this guy is? Peter Besselman. Peter Besseman, the last thing I heard was that he went to Brussels. I think he had always wanted to work there. And I think he, the last I heard was that he was working in Brussels in some administrative post or the other. Mm. Um, but I haven't, I haven't really seen him. Sandra Loeb, however, you know, we're in contact still. And she was also on the show. Yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. She's, she's been, she's yeah. been on the, on the episode. Yeah. Yes. Yes, 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 Sandra. She was, she was my breath of fresh air. You know, she was yeah, my she was my nice. silver lining. She you know, nice. on a on a cloudy day. <laughs> you know, yes, she was my escape to sanity yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Yes, because yes, really. You know, you you hear those words, escape to sanity. She was, you know. Yeah. Usually, usually, I only say that about art, and yeah. that is what she was. You know. <laughs> <laughs> She was good. She was good. <laughs> yes, 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 I yes. And we're still in contact. Yeah, I know. She was, she was good. We're still in contact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but... Pulu-man. You were a real Pulu man, you know? <laughs> well, I don't... You know, I still don't know what that means, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's funny, you know, I was the first one who called you Pulu man, Pulu-man. yes? And then you started calling me Pulu man, so I don't understand, you know? Maybe we're twins. I, yes. I, I was a great Polish pull you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, maybe 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 the one Pullman is so good he has to be a twin, you know, it cannot be one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. All right, tell you what, we, we have to get to this topic, Absolutely. David. You know, we we we've threatened to, to touch on this topic. And um yeah, all right. As you know. Yes, my life is now language training people, um, helping them to find their voice uh, in, in another language, you know, going through us or surviving a struggle that I myself went through, right? And um, I teach English and I organize, I facilitate also other languages, you know, uh, Spanish, French, um, no Russian yet, but Spanish and French and German. But finding voice, strong parallel with with your microstoria, that's one parallel. The other parallel is this podcast initiative of mine. It is, it is only happening because of something what I like to call a, a democratization of the learning experience, which means that everybody now has access to media. A lot of people have access to media. With the crisis now, the corona crisis, we're talking a lot about poverty in terms of media, you know, schools that don't have access to the internet and so on. But generally, more people have access and they can put their voice out, right? And uh, as I said in your um, presentation earlier, uh, people can take, take the stage. If they feel excluded from a stage, they can make their own, as I have opted to do as well. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be invited to every stage, so I, I make my own, you know, and th- this is this is a kind of not getting voice from anyone, but taking it. Yes. And articulating it on a, on a global scale. That is what podcasting to me represents. Now, um, if you think of finding voice, yes, um, how would you what does that mean to you as it relates to Microstoria? Well, so. I, I got into this um, uh, business of giving voices to uh, the poly, what I call polyphonic and subjugated voices uh, when I, I started my doctoral studies. And um, I, I was uh, interested in, in what we call, they say, there is this new emerging discipline in strategy we call strategy as practice. Mm-hmm. But strategy as practice actually emphasizes uh, everyday situated activities, what people say they do, uh, and uh, the, the gap between that and what they actually do in practice. So in accounting for strategy, our the argument is, is, is that uh, organizations or people don't have strategy. They actually do strategy. 
Mm -hmm. So they do strategy. So Mm -hmm. when I started, my question was, uh, if people actually do strategy, was it just top management team that does strategy? Mm -hmm. Or was it uh, everyone in the organization because everybody is doing something? Uh, mm-hmm. which basically fits into strategy. So strategy, like you said, is somehow democrat- it's supposed to be democratized in, in organizations. Mm-hmm. How, how do we unpack this? How, how do we theorize this? And the starting point was uh, a story I read. In, uh, uh, there is this professor. She, she, her name was Jazaboski. Uh, she used to be at Aston, then she moved to Cornell. And she wrote a book on strategy as practice. And all the stories she wrote in the actually act on my mind and, and and that is what got me into this. It was about um, a young guy or some man who was working in the London Underground and his job was very simple. Uh, he was supposed to oil the tracks at night. You know, in the London undra- Underground, the, the, the noise, the, the friction, you know, when the, the wheels are moving, you go in and you know, this squeaky noise. Sometimes it's mm-hmm. very mad. And uh, the idea was for him to oil the tracks in the night to reduce the friction, which obviously will reduce this crazy noise on, on, the, on, mm-hmm. on the tube. And um, this guy, uh, per the instructions that he was given, he was supposed to put, let's say, uh, 100 mils of oil by mile. Let's say roughly 100 mils by mile. And he's been doing it for some time. Um, but he thought he he came to realize quickly that when he puts the hundred mil per mile, the noise didn't really subside, and he really hated the noise himself. So he started putting trying something, started putting like three hundred mils. You know? mm-hmm. And uh, when he, he put three hundred mils, he realized that the sound really came down. It was really smooth, mm-hmm. and he enjoyed it. So he basically, you know threw away the instruction book. He sort of put it there. <laughs> and he just been pouring 300 on. You know, when he, he gets some new workers and they are going to help him do the work, they'll say, oh, it's 100 mil. I say, no, 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 ignore that. Put 300. It's, it's better. It reduces the sound, the noise much, much better. So he, he was doing this, you know, for five, seven years. Mm-hmm. Around the same time, coincidentally, the London Underground was making a lot of profits. Uh, they just couldn't tell. The reality was that they were no longer replacing the rail lines uh, as unexpected. So they were supposed to replace the lines, you know, every 300 meters, you know, by six miles mm-hmm. or whatever. And uh, rather than replacing them by six miles, they ended up now replacing them by, you know, every year instead of ah. six miles. So the underground was making lots of profit and mm. everybody was happy. And now they try to investigate, try to find out why, where the profit is coming from. Because obviously, they were not replacing the, 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 the tracks as quickly as they, they're supposed to, to do. So they, they set an investigation and uh, interviewing everyone who was on the line, the engineers, and then they go to the guy. And the guy said, well, I, I just put, you know, 300. And so it's just a bit surprising. Why do you do that? He said, oh, it reduces the noise. and well, you've asked me to put that on to improve the freshness and stuff, but I hate the noise, so I put 300 and it's better. So <laughs> they investigated, <laughs> they investigated, and they came to the conclusion that actually, because the guy was putting 300, that was what was helping so much with the friction, and for that matter, mm-hmm. uh, the wear it here had reduced mm-hmm. so much. Well, that is why they were not having to replace the the, the tracks every uh, six months. Mm-hmm. So then the question then goes, if we are going to classify what people do in organization uh, in terms of strategy, can we say that this man's job was strategic to the overall performance of London Underground? Mm-hmm. This guy was just on your tracks. He was being paid some minimum wage. So can we say his work was strategic? What he was doing was strategic. How do we account for this? <laughs> <laughs> because whenever we talk about strategy, everybody's talking about the top management team, you know, uh, man, middle managers, you know, board of directors. And here we are. We've come to realize that that little man, who nobody knows in the organization, 
his practices, his activities, whatever he was doing in this case as a form of creative deviance against yes. managerial orders was actually what was leading to profitability. And that, that's something that really inspired me, making me think, look, hold on. It is possible that there are so many people in organizations, especially those located at the lower end of the organizational hierarchy, who may be very, very, my, my, my PhD was on strategic foresight, who may be very, very foresightful, but because of where they are located. So we, we give all the praises to Steve Jobs. He's the most inventive guy, innovative. The reality is you will go to investigate and there is some poor chap <laughs> in the organization who studied physics or whatever, who comes up with some of these wacky ideas. All that Steve Jobs does is to encourage the guy to do the work and get people to think. And Steve Jobs will come to everybody in the whole world. He says Steve Jobs is the most innovative man. Mm -hmm. So the locus of strategic foresight is not necessarily at the top level of the organization. It's located down, and that is where we have to nurture it, as opposed to thinking strategic foresight, you know, top management team. It's like Elon Musk in recent times. You know, his name is everywhere. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. an innovator, he is this, but what, what does Elon Musk say? He doesn't really know anything, in fact. <laughs> well, he's been smart. Yeah. He's moving the money around. <laughs> well, but, so the reality is, you go in there, you'll be shocked. Potentially, maybe it might be her girlfriend or somebody who is doing everything for him. You never mm -hmm. know. That that happens quite a lot in history, no? Quite a lot. It's the same with the the, story of the women in the background. Yes, you know, it, we always say behind every good man there is a there, there's a good man, there's a a woman. Yes, but behind every bad man there's also a woman. Yes, <laughs> but um, <laughs> y you know. <laughs> It's, it's it's what I'm seeing here, David. I don't mean to cut you. Is that you? You first made the distinction between living strategy mm -hmm. and strategic vision. So what, uh, if I understood you correctly, through this guy living what he sees as strategy. I mean, I don't know if he was really exercising foresight by making the choices he did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or I don't know the extent of that foresight that informed his choice, but it definitely had strategic impact. It, yes. it, it has strategic impact. This is something he was doing, and um, he didn't know he, what he was doing was strategic to do. And of course, that is the bone of contention here, whether his his work or his actions were strategic. Uh, because when we are accounting for uh, how the organization has become profitable, from test books to popular media, everything is about the chief executive, it's about the top yeah. and team, it's about the board. So the 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 story here is uh, we have to pay attention to uh, people, especially those that traditional research will normally never ever focus on. And normally these are the little people. These are the people we can learn a lot from, and uh, discount. I wouldn't say discount. Maybe challenge some of the macro history. You no, know? uh, that that the, the great man story, great list stories that we hear every day. And, until we start to do that, we, we, we cannot bring people on board. We, 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 we keep talking about democratizing innovation, mm -hmm. democratizing. And in inclusiveness and all of that. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes. A lot of window dressing. Obviously. We, we, we very, very, very insulting sometimes, you know. Insulting. Very insulting. Yeah. What some of these people do. And very insulting, like you said, uh, which is very much related to uh, our ways of knowing, where we tend to discount other uh, forms of knowledge that do not fit neatly into our own uh, uh, worldviews, our own uh, paradigms, mm -hmm. uh, our own accepted epistemologies and stuff. And it is mm -hmm. time we, we, we look at other cultures, we look at those people at the lower end of the organization. Uh, uh, I, I, I mentioned witches, for example, the challenge. Yes, yes, yes. And I still think, you know, we just need to change their names. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> The, the charlatans and, and, and all those people to, to see whether there is something we could we could learn from these people and and it's interesting yes 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 indeed indeed david you know i definitely res resonate with that i physically resonated with it when you said it because you know even this thing the approach here is taking voice. It's not sitting and waiting and asking for it because the outfits of a lot of these larger organizations, right? There's no space for a small voice. There's no space for the man who cannot afford an Amani suit, for example, because, the, you know, 
the look of money is different from from the small voices that also have a contribution sometimes yes and um instead uh, as i agree with what you're saying i am well aware of the strategic impact that the small voice can give but um instead of sitting and waiting for it you know i mean i think you know people should recognize that they already have this voice and they should take the stage and make it themselves mm. that is that is what that that is where the the the, the can of of my inspiration mm. you know that's why i wanted to talk to you because we definitely agree with many things you know the, the other ways of knowing mm -hmm. i always talk about other ways of knowing um it's not just the people who are privileged or the organizations or the outfits that are privileged to take the mic who have a voice and can say something you know so so like like me for example i i i put my voice out there you know and if if somebody doesn't recognize that either what i'm saying or what you are saying is good it's not our problem it's really their problem because more people are recognizing through social nets and so on that they can start a movement with a hashtag mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. And it's 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 happening more and more, right? And uh, people are realizing as well that you know a lot of the the outfits up there, um, you know, we don't want to knock them too much because you know the outfits and the appearance of power and and leadership and and the the, the entitled voice and so on also has its place, you know. But well, um, so actually, that is one of the beauty or the blessings of uh, uh, the proliferating of uh, what I would call general purpose technologies like uh, mm -hmm. you know I mean? oh yes you mentioned that. Those, uh, which has really given um, um, opportunities or kind of a platform for people to 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 tell their stories and uh, uh, profoundly uh, help change um, uh, uh, their own stories in, in court, of course uh, change the narrative uh, uh, but um, like I said, um, we can encourage people, little people, to to talk, to do, to 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 rise up and take advantage of these opportunities and uh, uh, catch the fire, do whatever they can for them to be heard. But when the the, the entire system itself is, is set against them, then it becomes very difficult uh, because oh, systemic you know, oppression and silencing of these voices. Exactly, and, and that is one of the stuff that uh, the the UK ESRC, uh, Economic and Social Research Council, and stuff they, they've come to realize that uh, look, um, some of these changes will have to come from the top down. You know, it, it's about those at the top. You know, who are making the decisions. It's not uh, yeah, those at the top who are making the decisions. Actually, giving some bit of opportunities, you know. So, so for example, when when research funding calls come out, uh, for a very long time it was just focusing on uh, maybe uh, Western organizations. Uh, it was about profitability. Uh, it was about value creation, value capture. How do we improve uh, this technology, whatever, to do this to kill mosquitoes in in, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and and cure these diseases and so on and so. On. Then they realized, no. That is that is not really what what we need, especially if we want to solve some of the problems in the global south and even here, we have to harness the voices of these people. So they started uh, giving out money for calls such as uh, uh, those that go to the south to talk to, for example, women in, who are embedded in global commodity value chains, for example. So we talk about cocoa prices. We talk about chocolate being made wherever. And of course, we, we, we talk about uh, free trade chocolates and we have all this certification. You buy the chocolate, they tell you it's from the Amazon forest. People work on these days and that. But the reality is, yes, people work on it. We have to hear the stories of those women who are working on the farm. Uh, yes. I think trickling down to these people. What are the working conditions of these people in the supply chain? What are the working conditions uh, of these people uh, or their living conditions uh, in, in terms of these education programs and the profits and stuff, some trickling down. How are they being treated? Uh, children living in school, working on the cocoa farms, and, and how can we care those kind of stuff? And, and before then, it was all about 
purpose sitting in the West or we write on our papers here coming up with potential implications and theoretical implications and how our model that we've developed can help uh, 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 get, uh, you know, uh, women a better deal working in the chains in those cocoa farms. Mm. That's what we thought. But we've come to realize that most of the solutions that we were coming up with here, we go there and we implement them, they don't work. So, for example, those certification programs, uh, it's, it's, it's very typical. Uh, one of them, which actually was reported in, in Malaysia, uh, was a, a forest where uh, um, um, some, some timber logging companies were, were had licenses to, to work in this forest and and uh, they had all their products certified. You know, they cut one tree, they plant five, and uh, uh, their products were seen to be green. They had all the certification, which was amazing. And they tell the stories of they're building roads to those villages and, and people having electricity in, in those remote areas or whatever. Also, people went in there to talk to the people over there, and they realized the externalities. You know, some of these people where uh, the companies taking people there were raping the women in the villages, they were destroying people's farms, you know, they were doing whatever. And also we heard the voices of these people. If you think about the externalities of the uh, activities of these timber companies, and you uh, actually reconcile it, you balance it with the outcomes of the roof, whatever they said they built, you realize that no, we actually don't need that when we're destroying people's lives, when we're raping people, you know. So I think that paper they call it rape uh, something, something, you know, raping the forest and, and doing whatever you can. But and also also the woman. Yeah, but for a very long time, all the stories we hear is what the brand managers and uh, PR people are telling us what the company is doing, and we got this, we got a fantastic certification program that people were. We're, 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 we're passing through getting the needed certification to say that their product is green and it's that. And when you go down the value chain and you speak to these people, that is when you know that sometimes the externalities is, is, is actually worse than whatsoever that we are getting out of the system. So, yeah, the idea of yeah people people picking the mic themselves and and actually speaking up is great, but uh, we will have to also make conscious effort to uh, actually get people to to come up. It's like it's like the story of the uh, the, the, the black man in, in other parts of the world that we know of, where everybody say, yeah, 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 the black guys are not doing very well. They, you know, we we they have to go to school and whatever. They don't go to school, so they can't get into top professional occupations, whatever, whatever. Then in the end. Uh, in recent times, um, um, a black kid born in Nina London is actually 10 times likely or whatever to go to university than a white kid in, in Liverpool and stuff. Uh, the, the, some MPs, this one of the select committees, were very concerned that there were so many white boys being left behind. Yeah, um, Because things have really changed. Tony Blair had invested in city schools, you know, and this children were doing very well. So everybody started panicking. Yeah, in another form, saying, oh, look, the, the black kids are doing very well. Now, kids from the private areas, Liverpool and stuff, are not going to school and all those kind of stuff. And uh, the idea is we have to give them also support, whatever, whatever. And basically, it, it was just some right-wingers, actually. I, I think they were just pushing this agenda. And, and that was more or less becoming the narrative. You go down there and uh, you hear the stories, then that is where you realize that a white kid, those white kids in Liverpool, are not going to university, not because they cannot go to university. It's because they don't see any value in going to university. Yeah, because when they just finish GCSE, they could get a job as a manager, or they could get a job easily and rise through the rank whatever, and become a manager, whatever, without going to university to to, to spend 9000 a year. And uh, by the time he finishes in three years, he's owing over 30000 excluding maintenance. And the black kids, who are rather going to the school, they are not getting jobs. <laughs> you, you get a point. Yeah. So they are not getting yeah. jobs. But it appears, when you look at the data and you see those black kids going to school, lots of them, 
you think, oh, they are doing well and look, these people are being left behind. But the reality is um, they, they are going to school, but uh, the black guy is still uh, maybe 10 times or five times more likely to be unemployed. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. You know, I mean, I, I don't really want to touch on that too much. I mean, that's, that's, no, no, that's no. high politics. No, no, no. What, I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, it's just, it's just the idea of microstoria is breaking down some of these broad narratives. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, until we break that down, obviously, we all want everyone to have opportunity. We want everyone to, to go up. And we, we don't want the situation. So you can say, yeah, you want to... Uh, uh, maybe a black kid or whatever people show will have to stand up their opportunities now to, to tell their own stories or whatever. But if the system doesn't allow you, that is why that is why the select committee and people we are, they are working on it. It's, it's, it's a big issue here for us. We are working on it to try to help those people at the base. So it, it's not just the people. You, so you can be at the low level and you can do whatever you can. But when the system is structurally against you, then it, it becomes very difficult to break through. So the, the idea of micro story is to give them the chance and, of course, challenge some of these taking for granted assumptions, um, which most of them may be right or some, some mm -hmm. may be wrong. And um, that, that is the logic of micro story. It's, 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 it's not just from the bottom you know it's not, it's not just the prosopoty where you, you have people coming from the ground moving up but it's also people from the from the top coming down to the organization to listen this, to the stories of these people because until you get to understand how your 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 uh, your cleaner actually survives until you get to understand the life the lived experience of that factory hand um you as a manager, when it comes to negotiating for, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 um, um, when, when it comes to even negotiating salaries or wages and stuff, you don't want to give way. You know, you, you, you think, look, it's more than enough. Until people come down there to listen to the stories and, and get to realize that, look, a lot more help has to be given to people at the lower level. Mm -hmm. And obviously, uh, um, those disparities that exist between the rich and the poor will continue to widen. And it starts from the organizations in which we are embedded. So it's an opportunity for those at the top to hear the stories of, of those down there. And obviously, um, it provides opportunities for those down there to have their stories heard at the top. And also make Understood. input into, make input into um, um, organizational decisions. Uh, it, yes. should, it shouldn't just be uh, um, uh, managers and top management teams and board of mm -hmm. directors and so on. Uh, there are ordinary people in organizations who are also heroes, who are doing amazing work. And the idea is to shine light on them um, so that they can also tell their stories. I understand. You know, David, there is no reason for us to have to agree to disagree. I agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> You know, and it's absolutely no reason. I can't think of any good reason to dispute anything you're saying. You know, the, the only thing is that, I mean, we're talking about parallels here. And I'm of the opinion that, yes, Microstoria has to, you know, allow voice of, you know, the small man or the small woman, the small person. However, there has to be also a kind of a meeting in the middle because, you know, I mean, you know, let's be honest to ourselves, you know, I mean, st some status quos want it to stay exactly the way it is. And, and um, you know, while, yes, we can try to encourage, you know, whether it's the powers that be or the establishment or the system or whatever you might call it, to talk to the small people as well, you have to also give the small people the mics and the means to also express themselves and try to do it for themselves. You know, I mean, even... If you look at like, uh, I don't know so much about the Turkish uh, society here in Berlin, but um, there were so many here invited with, you know, to, to Germany to help with rebuilding the country. So many that they managed to create their own economy. Yes, because if, you know, I mean, it's not so easy for a foreigner to get sometimes alone. Yes. And or, or you have to tell a long story. Like, again, a reason why I do this podcast is because if I go and I try to 
get a job, right? I have to explain for three, four, five, six hours why I came to Germany, why I really came to Germany, why I chose Germany over the UK, why not America, and all these things before before they start asking me about the price. So before they start asking me about the price, so I put my voice out there. So listen, man, you want to know who I am? Listen to the show. If you don't like who I am, don't waste my time. You understand? Yeah. So, so what I do is 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 like, you know, it is is not is not any kind of disrespect, you know. It's just a kind of an an efficiency mm. that also the small voice has to also take the initiative mm. to express themselves and go out in there. Because if you sit and wait for the system, the system, I think power takes care of itself mm. first. Mm. That's what power does, mm. you know. And um, and yes, of course, while we can. You implore and, and and ask you know the the guys at the top to listen to the guys at the bottom i don't know if this is in their best interest to do that all the time i don't know so you know I, I, both of them have to be done at the same time that is what i would um contend yeah, yeah absolutely 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 both, both of them have to do at the same time but um there are there are some at the bottom who have been robbed of their agency for a very long time that they've, they've actually lost uh, the, the power to, to speak for themselves and uh, or just by where they are located and those people uh, also we have to cater for so my job okay as an yeah academic, you're true my job as an academic is to make that um, what we call um, looking a bit more obvious and that is why when i'm on the esrc panel or i go to the british academy I'm, I'm 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 one of the vice chairs and uh we i've been choosing the topics that we are going to study i have to tell them you know I, you have to um uh, continue to remind people the reason why we don't have to um forget about the people at the lower end and why maybe some issues need further exploring. For a long time, we've left these cases or these issues for the sociologists and uh, those in the in the pure humanities to deal with. Uh, but uh, most of these problems are actually caused by organizations. And mm -hmm. we as management scholars uh, now have to take the bull, the home, uh, the bull by the home, and uh, take a bit a bit of the responsibility that if we can. If we can change organizational life a bit more, you know, uh, then obviously um, life could be better. If um, I'm not, I'm not saying the German system is the best, but it's much so much touted around the world when it comes to um, the social a, a relationship between employers and employees in Germany. Where that is true. No that is true, on, indeed. On the board and and. and for us here, we talk about it every day, but obviously, you know, the limits of capitalism and, and, and in the UK, how, <laughs> how we, 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 we chase him, you know, the, the, the American model. And mm -hmm. sometimes um, our voices serves as a bit of kind of bricks on, on, on this fast move to, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say the right, <laughs> kind of fast move to uh, um, um, capitalism, kind of extreme in the, in the Catholic form where um, um, we, we pay little attention to uh, those that we trample over to get to the top. Uh, so, so, so as an academic, um, uh, a minority academic, obviously, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's been a fantastic opportunity to actually um, start this particular research program, which I've been mm -hmm. by the academy to, to write this up as a, as a kind of a working paper, hopefully, uh, to the next conference where we can discuss and, and talk a lot more about it. So the reality is, uh, Ian, um, micro story isn't new. People have been writing about witches and 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 and, and, and charlatans and people in the belly new migrants, you know, being chased by horses for a very long time. Um, Fringe societies. <laughs> absolutely. But yes. but we've we've never had um kind of uh, uh, a rubric, you know, to put all this kind of uh, disparate works under to to say, hey, this is this is what it means when you're doing stories for little people. 
this uh, 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 this is the paradigm that you take. It's just a postmodernist view uh, where you you challenge the macro social, you, you get into the middle, like you said, try to empower the polyphonic voices, try to encourage those at the top to listen to the polyphonic voices, break barriers, uh, give people technologies and 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 uh, how do you call it spaces uh, to stand and, and 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 let their voices be heard and. Presenting it under the rubric of microstoria has been quite amazing. That, that was the, when I presented it um, uh, here. Well, put it, um, I think that was the second time I was presenting it. And people get excited. and would say, oh, I've been doing microstoria. I didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know my work was microstoria. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that is what we do very well in management, where we, we, we put uh, kind of spins and and stuff on, on things, kind of old wine in new mm -hmm. bottles, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we're, <laughs> we're able to sell it, and that is what I'm trying. So I'm not claiming this is something new at all. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. not new, uh, but I, I would say in simple terms, of, of kind of repackaging uh, uh, these disparate ideas into something coherent, uh, something that everyone can make sense of, and everybody can say, hey, look, I'm doing my story. And, but someone said, I'm doing micro story. And, oh, okay, this is what you're doing. Oh, okay, that's interesting. And yeah, it could, it could end up becoming a whole research program. You are now listening to the English Coach Podcast, where I attempt to add a splash of color and life to your learning experience by inviting you to live the language. The show is self-sponsored and independent and offers you immersion into the language in a fun and interesting way. The English Coach Podcast takes my usual relaxed, accessible human approach to your learning experience and, by definition, celebrates the virtues of diversity and inclusion, real people, real themes, and personalities from wherever you are. Now, this is not a formal lesson. It's a show. But if you are interested in signing up for lessons, group coaching, in supporting the show generally, or simply in getting involved... Do it direct and feel free to head on over to www.trainingtree.de slash podcast or englishcoachpodcast.com. Like it if you like it. And if you don't, lie to me. Just kidding. Anyway, share the show with a friend or if you like it a lot, keep it all to yourself and simply sign up to join my private listeners group. As an independent podcaster, it's important to me personally to at least try to protect the integrity of my own content and to resist as much as I can being co-opted into anyone else's ads-driven paradigm together with all the stealthy violations of your privacy and mine. Signing up directly means that absolutely no third-party app download is necessary. If you so choose, you get to receive all the episodes sent to you by email directly from me, private and ad-free, the way it was meant to be. So then, without further ado, on with the show. Yes. You know, David, to be to be honest, um, and, and and also positive because you know I, I can do cynical and and skeptical if I want to but <laughs> yeah. you know we don't we don't have to do that Absolutely. right and that doesn't that doesn't really help to be honest in all fairness as well you are you are well positioned to 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 make a, a change a difference mm -hmm. and um, I I tended to to think more heavily well I don't know I saw the international business here um, but one of the major crises I had in life was afterwards I studied um, sustainability you know leadership for sustainability in Lancaster yes and and you know that that, that brought me into a conflict personal conflict because I realized that the capitalistic drive will never I think or I thought at the time that would never come together with sustainability which sustainability in and of itself is ecological and social mm. yes and i thought they could never come together but regulation more regulatory positions as 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 you enjoy right now you know as a little outside of the capitalism you can help to to articulate or show to these 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 uh, more capital uh, profit driven organizations that it can be also profitable mm. to be 
to be you know more conscious more 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 i don't want to say socialist mm -hmm. yes but more 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 inclusive mm -hmm. in your way of doing things inclusive of voices inclusive of you know uh, diversity mm -hmm. of 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 of, of co cognitive cognitive faculties whatever you want to call it uh, more open to other sources mm -hmm. yes you can illustrate that to them you can you can make the right form uh put put in the right framework mm -hmm. and put it to them from a position of of of, of um an academic mm -hmm. so you know all is not lost you, you, I, you know all i'm saying is that you're well positioned to do sure, that sure. better than most of us sure. you know the the, the, yeah. the case of sustainability as you mentioned is quite interesting isn't it uh look looking back think of 2002, when, when we started at Frankfurt Oda, mm -hmm. not a single module on sustainability. I, I never, ever heard anybody even mention that word. It wasn't in, our, in the lexicon of business and management at all. Yes, yes, yes. Fast, fast, forward, fast forward 20 years uh, now, uh, every single accreditation that a business school goes for, you have to show your sustainability credentials. You, mm -hmm. How are you integrating sustainability into your your programs and how you are supporting you know, students uh, in terms of being ethical for the environment. And, and you, you look back, you realize this was a movement that potentially was started by very few people and uh, they were not back. But over time, it's gradually becoming mainstream to the extent that we now have a program on sustainability, which uh, uh, you, 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 you actually uh, enrolled on, which, which is quite quite interesting and 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 and, and that is what I, i'm sure is, is going to happen um it, it's just the same if we, we look back 20 years ago um the voices of the ordinary people uh, when it comes to uh, management and stuff was very minimal but uh today yes. you look you look at the papers we are publishing and stuff uh you, you see the stories of women in uh, uh some cooperative union uh, somewhere in Indonesia, and how they, they managed to build a resilient kind of a, a cooperative system that, that helped them to thrive, and, and so on. And, and, and these people, uh, their the whole tracks, special issues on, on, on sustainability in emerging markets. And, and over here, we, we saw from the COP26 uh, how people have become a bit more serious about, uh, you can imagine 20 years back, somebody talking about the globe uh, heating up and, and cutting down on carbon. You know, mm -hmm. As a, a lunatic, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Green Party in Germany, you know, some years yeah. back. Yeah. So I, I think we are making some progress. and uh, We are indeed. A lot of it starts in academia as well. You uh, know, the, the, the buzzword in my time when I applied for, for Frankfurt Order mm -hmm. was um, globalization. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, uh, and 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 then you know we all studied international business and it was fantastic, and then you know it's funny because when, you, when I was studying leadership for sustainability, mm -hmm. nine out of ten people would ask me, "What is that? Why are you studying leadership for sustainability?" And after Donald Trump, I think many of them now understand why leadership for sustainability is important because <laughs> that guy went through and and killed off as many environmental programs as he could yeah yeah you yeah. know yeah and yeah. and 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 you know i mean i think now people understand i mean now the the another buzzword is is inclusion and diversity yeah. and issues with that as well you know the the, the photo ops uh yeah. i see these colorful photos all the time and i ask myself you know <laughs> what is what is the color of the board but um you know i don't say that too loud <laughs> But you know, to be fair, you know things things will take time to change. It does. Um, and um, women have been making a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's nothing strange for for a lot of people, you know, because like in Jamaica, for example, a friend of mine once said, you know, the women in Jamaica are emancipated and liberated. The men just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. And this was in two thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jamaica had. Um, the most women in management, leadership positions, 56%, mm -hmm. yes, in the world, the most women in leadership positions in the world. And this is by um, some labor organization, global labor organization. It's, uh, you know, a study conducted. So, so, you know, this idea of strong woman and giving ladies leadership 
you know, and so on and so on. My mother is a strong woman. My sister is a strong woman. I've always been surrounded by strong women. It's not an event for me. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not an event. It's nothing strange, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, yeah. and, and I think also in a lot of African societies as mm-hmm. well, uh, you know, women enjoy um, power, positions of power in society, not all societies, yeah. sadly. But, you know, this idea of strong woman and giving you put a woman in leadership positions. This is not nothing new mm. to to me. That, you know? that, that 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 brings to mind also the the some of the some of the stuff that um, uh, Michael Story is expected to do is to put some bit of nuances on on some mm-hmm. of this. I wouldn't call them macro stories, but micro stories too. Um, so mm-hmm. we 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 just said we've made some progress some twenty thirty years ago. Yes, we've we've made some progress. Um, Looking at the statistics, yes, women have done extremely well. Um, oh, yes. More than 28% of my women getting into managerial jobs. And, and the, the funny thing is, the whole agenda of EDI is... More than 20 In Jamaica, it's 56%. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking globally. And, 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 okay, I'm, okay, okay. And the whole, the whole push forward, that we all say we've done well and stuff. If you if you look at the micro picture and the nuances of it, you realize that all the emphasis has been women going forward. I, I'm not against women, but it's just been women. What about ethnic minorities? And even if you go down into the women, you will realize that 99% of these women have been regular white women who have benefited from this agenda of and Microstoria actually puts a bit of light on this kind of nuances. Uh, mm-hmm. Yesterday, there was a professor at Sussex who just uh, resigned uh, because she's one of those uh, post-feminist theorists and she's just running to classes with, with, with people. And when she was talking about her career, you know, she said in the 1970s or 80s when she was doing her PhD, it was populated by men. And mm-hmm. it was very problematic. We say, how do we improve things? And and say, so, yes, there have been improvement. There are now about 30% women professors and all those kind of then she herself went. Given that we've done all this progress, you see, when you hear about the progress in terms of EDI, and we go to all these board meetings, and sometimes we are reporting, it's reported as EDI, but when you go in there, you will see that okay, women have done very well. But what about the, the BME people? And obviously, I'm, when I say BME people, I'm including the women mm-hmm. also in the BME. So all the, the women who have done very well, less than 1% will be BME. And she cited the statistics of UK professors because, so, so she said, oh yeah, more than 100%, also it was all male. Then in 20 years, years time now, as at now, well, 30 years or 40 years, uh, we've gone to 20-something percent, 8 percent. She said it was great. What about black professors? Less than 1 percent. After this time, you know, less than 1 percent. But until we tell this story, until we go in there, you know, my story, the nuances, and and we've got, so less than 1 percent, black professors in the UK now are 156 and probably the 157th. And it's, it's a fantastic story. It's, it's great. But the micro story of it, when I tell you the processes I had to go through, that is when you realize that the, the pathway is, is not that smooth. It's not just about your academic abilities or your output. And, and, and sometimes some of these nuances, the, the micro history, the micro stories, actually help to uh, unpack the journeys help make things clearer, then we can know maybe why we still have those low numbers. It's not it's not about um racism or all those kind of stuff. They 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 are bygone. They are not the most exciting arguments to make, you know. But look I don't even use that word anymore, you know. Yeah. I, I say I usually say group behavior exactly. because it's 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 group behavior. It group, really. Yeah. And it's moved to it's moved to what we call intersectionality. Mm-hmm. You know, they are, they, you, so 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 nobody dislikes somebody because of their race. It's just it's just mm-hmm. 
it's just stupid stuff to talk about these days. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. issue of intersectionality is when uh, people having different identities, you know, we, we all have different identities. So mm -hmm. as you are sitting here, you are a Jamaican, you are a German, another identity, you are a teacher, uh, you, you, you are a sustainability scholar, uh, you have a dog, so you are a pet. And, and I have a cat, a cat, a cat. sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, Her name is Kitty. Exactly. So, <laughs> so, so, it is it is all these identities that intersect. Mm -hmm. All these identities then intersect to define your life outcomes or social mm -hmm. outcomes. And so, it's it's those kind of little little things. So, which make people, uh, for example, become a bit of. Uh, 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 having all those kind of hindsight biases and uh, mm -hmm. inkling biases, you know. So yeah, he doesn't he doesn't hate black people or whatever, but he doesn't yeah. But, but he's more familiar with yeah, another if type. He see, if he sees that, if he sees somebody uh, who has a different accent like mine, uh, mm -hmm. who throws his hands in the how, uh, who is laughing out loudly. Who, who uh, potentially, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, has a, is in a second marriage or, or mm -hmm. something? The assumption is, is straight away, oh, this person is not a serious guy. He is not. You, you, you get a point. It's that kind of I, different identities which come to shape us. So I remember one, one, one professor was telling me this. We, we're having a chat, and at first, uh, gone for my first professorial interview at the University of Kiel. And I came back and some of the questions were just awkward. So we were discussing and then he went, how oh, dare it? Don't you, if you had gone to Oxford or Cambridge, don't you think you have gotten a chair by now? It's long overdue. But not Kiel? Like, Kiel in Germany? No, there's another Kiel in the UK. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, what? So, and I had applied to the uh, one university here, um, very close to where I live. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, the, somebody asked me to send my CV when, when I, I inquired of the job informally. Send the CV and this professor just open it. You know, and on the phone, when it landed on it, it's like, oh, here. Open it and just went, oh, David, yeah, you know, we are not looking for publishing machines. You know, mm. when somebody described you as a publishing machine, it's like you just publish papers. That's mm -hmm. what we are looking for. Yes, but yes. You get yes. it. So this is what we call. Um, it's just more like stigmatizing excellence. You know, stigmatizing excellence. So mm -hmm. when you go anywhere as an academic, everybody would, we need, it's, it's all about papers. Now yes, you write. Yes, yes. I write too many papers. And mm -hmm. my intersectionality as somebody who didn't go to, so I write in the papers. Stigmatizing excellence. That's funny. You know, it's funny. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, you know, for in Germany, in Germany, for example, if you have, if you're multi-talented, mm -hmm. right? Here, um, instead of saying, well, that's good, you can do many yeah. things and so on, they say that you don't know what you want. To do. <laughs> Exactly. And on that, you know, I've been I've been rejected jobs here because they look at my proposal and they say, "Oh, you know, this is too good. You're gonna stress our people." Yeah. <laughs> and and I don't get the job. You have to be known for something. Like, I, you are not known. I don't. I, no, I don't get the job. And and you know, they prefer to take some little student yeah. from the UK who wants to come to Berlin to party, yeah. and they take that little student from the UK to teach yeah. them English. Student yeah. who knows nothing about explaining anything about grammar, nothing about work, nothing about anything. She just has the identity, yeah. yes? Yeah, and she gets, a, she gets a job over, over me. She's yeah. not qualified as any kind of trainer yeah. or anything, right? And they say to me, well, you know, my proposal is too good and I'm going to stress their people. So on that basis, I cannot get the job. Yeah, so that is some of the intersectionality. So <laughs> if when my CV went there, she said I'm a publishing machine. If I had gone to Cambridge or Oxford, do you know what she would have said? She, she would have said, so we just go and say, oh, man, this guy is so bright. Oh, this Cambridge boy. So, so it's not it's not that he she, she didn't like me or and I tell you this person is actually 
I wouldn't say she's my friend, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm on some some board with her. Um, she's, we, we, we don't. She, it just came out of her mouth like that. Mm-hmm. Then she realized that oh, that was a mistake. So she went to oh, you know, David. Uh, we are looking for people who do stuff in global challenges, which was a lie, you know. <laughs> so mm-hmm. some of these little little stories, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's probably quite exciting. We put nuances on. On, on the micro story uh, of, of this little people. And, and we can try to balance a bit more, you know, mm-hmm. um, help to balance. And and um, we, we run all these um, workshops, uh, especially when, when it's recruitment time. I used to be uh, one of the uh, head of departments, the, the line managers. And uh, uh, whenever we are going to recruit, there is uh, this video stuff that we have to watch and all that to help us, you know, avoid... Uh, those kind of, you know, uh, hindsight biases and trying to help us to improve on our own thinking in terms of EDI and you, you don't have to judge people and all those kind of stuff, which is all great. But normally most of those exercises that we have um, end up, you know, taking the old boxes, which is not exciting any longer. It's the old boxes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yes. exciting. And uh, yeah, it's, just, it's interesting. Quite interesting. It bores, it bores me sometimes, David. And you know, that's why, as I said, you know, I do the show. So if people are curious, they can find out who I am. If they don't like me, then they don't waste my time. And, yeah. um, you know, I like the way you started with, for example, positive um, messages on our experiences in Frankfurt Oda. Mm-hmm. And there were many, there were many. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say as well, um, so I feel bad for the many wonderful people that I've met mm-hmm. in this country. Mm-hmm. I've met so many good people here. As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. after having lived a lifetime in Germany, um, maybe there are even more good people that I know here now than I ever did in my home yeah. country. It's a yeah. possibility of yeah. that. Possible. Because it's only now that I'm really, you know, paying attention to character yeah. and, 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 and so on um, in, at this age. So it's a good possibility that a lot of good people that I know, nice people, very balanced, very open, very fair, um, not really biased in any way. Oh, um, I've met here. Very, very good people. You know, sometimes when I talk to some people about some of the struggles, you know, they just start crying, you know, and uh, and 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 that's another thing, you know. There's a kind of we speak of a fragility sometimes. Sometimes, you know, um, I've met Europeans who are much more fragile to these issues than I am. Mm. You know, mm. I I talk about some other things, and I you know I just say, well, you know, it's just uh, it's it's quite part of the game, and and they start crying, you know, and I'm like, well, you know. When, when we were in Frankfurt, there were at least one or two guys who probably never spoke to me. And mm-hmm. it was getting after the second year there about the second year about, but I had a chance to speak to them. And you start talking to them, then you realize it's not that the guy doesn't like you. Mm-hmm. It's not a cultural difference sometimes. It's just that he's never had a chance to even get closer to somebody who is as different as you. And yes, yes, it's really sometimes it's not, it's not really yeah. racism. He doesn't yeah. really know how to go about it, you know? Mm-hmm. And you start to talk to the person, you know, how nice. There was a mm-hmm. thing, his name was Cheetah or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. You, yeah, you realize how nice they are. Uh, mm-hmm. Germans, I, I personally feel uh, I'm 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 such a a, a German uh, uh, how do you call it filia, you know? Uh, I, what do you mean? I kind of uh, how do you call it? It's the other way around. Um, how do you call it? Um, yeah, I, we say Russophile. What do you say? Somebody who is pro-German. What, what do you call it? Pro, you're pro-German. You're a German apologist. <laughs> <laughs> As in, as in, no. I, I like them. <laughs> me too, me too. Yes, it's yes, just, yes. It's just looking back the opportunity that they give me, you know, and having to cope with me sometimes, like I said. <laughs> when you go to parties with empty house. <laughs> Yeah. 
I remember yeah. uh, this guy, Pascal. Uh-huh. You know, his surname is Quintus. I know, yeah. And you, I, in yeah. Ghana and stuff, you know, you, you just, your friend, you just pick one of his names, the one that you really like. So I mm-hmm. have lots of friends who just call me Sapo. And, and it's, it's okay, it doesn't matter whether you call me yeah. by my surname or my first name. Yeah. And I remember I used to call him Quintus. And mm-hmm. I just, just, just call him. I kept calling him. You could see that he's exasperated. You over time, you look back and you say, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! Yeah, yeah, it was it was a fantastic time. It's war. David, it's war. You know, it's war. Yes, and so, some some you know, it's funny with nostalgia. You know, the further you go away from it, and oh, you yeah. know, in retrospect, you recognize how how good it was. Yeah, it was good. It was yes, yes, yes. It was good. Me in Lugenstrasse. Oh my god! But yes. Poland was good. Poland was amazing. It was I good know. for me because uh, it was cheap. You remember? Oh, mm-hmm. like 50 euro yes i remember i remember yeah, you were there uh, yeah you invited me over as well yeah, it's also and, good. Um, it's also yes good. yes yes i remember some of your shenanigans as well movie <laughs> 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 you know <laughs> Yes, 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 indeed. Right, indeed. Right. Oh man, you know, David, I had all these questions for you. I wanted to ask you about transformation and you being an educator mm-hmm. and, and, and how you approach transformation and how, you know, things like that. Very nice. You saw the questions already. Yeah. But you know, in our own way, conversational way, you've touched on pretty much all of them. Mm-hmm. I just have to check again to see. Um, the the you spoke of the Ghanaian the Ghanaian context and um, specific examples you also gave, yes I think from from Ghana of how microstoria or mindfulness of microstoria has changed lives in your country. Yeah, it, it's quite exciting um, hearing all these um, uh, funny myths and mythologies. So. Uh, where you thought it was restricted to just Africa. Then you, you come to Europe, growing up, you get to know that the, the Native Americans also had this little people. And actually, I, I, I was in, in my car this afternoon and somebody on the BBC was talking about a story where I thought, this is little people, which I'm very sure you read this story when you were a child. Mm-hmm. What about the elves? Who oh, yes. the shoemaker's shop, you know, the shoemaker was very poor. They yes. didn't have money or whatever, and he would buy leather with his last money, hoping to make some shoe. The next mm-hmm. morning, he had the elves coming in to make fantastic shoes. Yes, I broke, remember that. You know, and, and I said, Whoa, we've got a little people here too. <laughs> and, and we've got the same kind of, I would say, troops, you know, where. The people are are kind of they are not seen. They are they are mythical. They they go to bed. They come in the morning. The people have done all the work for them. Then uh, the the shoemaker and his wife went to buy some socks or something for them. When they came in, you know, they, they put them on. And so so these people are helpers. They come in. They doing a whole lot of stuff. But do we understand their world? Where did they come? How do they work? And and translating that into our everyday lives, um, it, it's just round parallel or it's reflective of the little people in our lives, which we see every day, but or notice. We see them, but we don't notice them. You see the poor guy begging for coins on, on the Berlin trains or something. You see him, you don't even notice him. Um, it's just like how the top managers, uh, you know, see the cleanest, but they don't even notice them. It's just like our society where sometimes um, because we've, uh, and organizations and the kind of stuff we teach in our business schools and preach, 
It's all about value creation, value capture. It's all about being an entrepreneur and making money. That we mm, forget about value capture. Mm -hmm. We forget <laughs> about uh, uh, the little people uh, 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 elsewhere, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's quite it's quite interesting. Sometimes when we are told some of these little stories, that is the only time you you, you start to reflect. So as we see in going to India or going to Ghana or in Latin America, where you see all these women on the rubbish town mm -hmm. collecting bottles, they're still going to sell. And you think, oh, look at them. Of course, they are poor going to sell these bottles. But at no point will you ever think, oh, come on, hold on. These people are involved in some entrepreneurship. The only difference is that they are barefoot entrepreneurs. They have very little resources. But the idea of opportunity recognition in entrepreneurship that we teach every day is being played out there. The idea of effectuation is being played out there. The idea of creating and capturing value. So they create value. They collect this rubbish. They clean them or whatever. They sell it on. They capture value. They make money. And you will be surprised that some of these people have been selling this plastic and managed to keep their children in school. To their of course. Family. Yeah, that they don't need arms from other people. They don't need to rely on other people. They will put at least two square meals you know, on the table for their kids. And that kid would have gone to become the CEO of, of, of a big organization the next day in, in, in India or something. So is there something that we could learn from these little people? And also... We come to realize that they are also entrepreneurs. That compassion and stuff that we're supposed to extend to them, we don't even, you know, think of it because we don't see them as entrepreneurs. Maybe there's opportunity to just go and um, uh, uh, talk to them and encourage them and show them some basic bookkeeping practices that would help them, you know, to make a better life out of those plastic bottles. But until we come to realize, until we make people know that these people are also entrepreneurs, they will always be just treated as rapid stamp people. But they also have a role they play in the organization, isn't it? It's like the hospitals. It's the hospitals where nobody talks about the cleanliness, you know, this COVID time. Everybody mm -hmm. talks all about the nurses, the doctors in the UK were clapping for NHS workers. Nobody's talking about the cleanliness. But the reality yeah. is the, the fundamental uh, fight against COVID was organized around cleaning and 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 wiping and and these people were the ones wiping the surgical stuff you know all those people in the icu the clothing all the, oh, the beds uh linings and, and all they are washing them they are making their meals in the kitchens Just scrubbing the walls and ceilings yeah. scrubbing the walls which is the fundamental you know mm -hmm. so fundamental yes. to fight against against COVID. And, and here yes. we are. You think about it. If all these cleaners were to go on strike for even two days, what would have happened? Meanwhile, what if, what if all minorities went on strike for two days? <laughs> Is that like... Meanwhile, yeah, I had a dream. I had a dream about that one night. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, when, we, when in the UK we we're talking about uh, giving something back to NHS workers and. For the work they've done for us during the COVID time, it was the nurses they mentioned, and mm -hmm. the nurses were upset because their salary increase was only two percent or so. And mm -hmm. uh, public sector, everywhere we were getting one percent or so, and everybody was saying the nurses did a fantastic job. We should give them more, and they wanted to go on strike. They were making all sort of noise, mm -hmm. and nobody mentioned the cleaner, the little, who, who also played a good role, you know, massive. Yes, but you know, David, I mean, uh, uh, looking at this whole thing positively as well, you know, changes are happening. Yeah. Because, yeah. Um, for example, microfinancing is enjoying a lot more respect mm -hmm. these days, mm -hmm. microfinance. Mm -hmm. And even again, from this whole podcast thing, we talk a lot about value for value, mm -hmm. which is... Um, uh, like me as a creator, there's a tendency for me to give my media data to, to the Facebooks and the Googles and the Instagrams and so on. And they take ownership of my stuff. But many people are now realizing that, you know, you should be giving your data to these guys because oh. these guys are curators. They don't create anything. And oh. there is no reason for any company to get that rich. And that is because... 
you have so many idiots giving their media to them, mm. right? So the whole idea of value for value is, for example, with me now, I can have a podcast and I can, for example, accept donations from my audience mm. in a thing they call Satoshi, which is something like one millionth of a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cryptocurrencies, micropayments. Mm -hmm. Yes. Through fr fr from my from my audience directly and um, kind of cuts out the middleman. Mm. And it's uh, it's 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 value yeah. for value and it's micropayments. Right. And, and and again, the other example, micropayments um, in, in, in Africa and other. Well, Africa is a continent, you know, there are lots of countries, but in, in Europe, for example, or in um, many developed societies they like to use africa as a test bed right. and they go there to find unique innovation that right. they would never have thought of for example the use of micropayments yeah. yes a lot of people go there to study how oh, these right. people think of these things yeah. yes yeah. And, and 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 try to try to emulate the, the the innovation that probably started on the garbage dump you've actually just given me this is interesting. If if I've just I've just got a topic here for, I'm definitely going to get one of my MSc students to do their dissertations on this. When most of them come to you, they have no idea what they are going to do for their dissertation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'll get some of them to go and do the micro story of hospital clinics during COVID nineteen. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about micropayments for podcasting. <laughs> 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 okay. Quite interesting. Yes. We, we've heard the stories of doctors, the nurses, you know. How did they come to school? You can imagine. Yeah, you know, I have a lot of friends who are nurses. I have a male nurse. My roommate, no, her son is a male nurse. Mm -hmm. And I have another good friend of mine who is, she is um, what's called an ergotherapist. So she works with older people, like old people who are, you know, in homes. Yeah. And um, she has to be tested every single day because her the people she she takes care of yes retired old people you know sometimes some of them bedridden some of them are suffering dementia or so on she has to also um go through a very strict um regiment my sister works in the care home mm -hmm. and uh, i've got two of my phd students plus one of their friends yeah, three of them who live very close by they were they were they, they all do care work and mm -hmm. in the UK care work is uh, one of the commonest kind of stuff and mm -hmm. and some of the stories and it was harrowing yeah very harrowing yeah. you know we we were not doing very well at all in the in the early days you know we were we were it was it was very bad in the UK until we got stabilized and I I remember yeah. Of times, I I caught I caught COVID. Did you did you ever catch COVID? Well, I'll knock on wood, you know, say prayers to the gods of wood. <laughs> but I I got um three three my three shots. Um, yeah. it's come close to me, very close, but I I don't think I got it. I got it. Or I, yeah, tested, I don't I think tested, so. I tested positive. That was the December, uh, mm -hmm. last not the last December before this one. Yeah, by then. Oh, really. Yeah, yeah, I tested because by now I have I've not had my job because you know the, it was based on age the, the way mm -hmm. running, so it wasn't my ten yet. And yeah, I tested positive, but it was quite mild. Um, so you got it before a vaccination? Yes, yes, it's symptomatic. Oh dear, oh dear, asymptomatic. Yeah, I suspect that I might have had it asymptomatically, yeah. but you know, I mean, I got all my three vaccinations. Yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah. I was feeling poorly and uh, mm -hmm. I was talking to one of my PhD students who worked in the care home and I've not heard from her for some time so we were talking Then she said oh she's tested positive and, and I said oh really so how do you feel and we we're talking and I told her oh I'm also not feeling very well uh, mm -hmm. so I went test when do I test and so oh, just put in I put in Google then I realized one was just uh, about two miles from my house so I just I just mm -hmm. put there. By the time I got home positive, the result came on my phone. Then I went back in there to uh, do a follow-up test. It was positive, so instantly I have to call my children's school. My wife had to stop working. I had to go and get all the kids because... And I had to self-isolate for 
Uh, it was it 10 days by then or so? And it was a bit of, I, I think it, 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 it was killing me mentally. It's, it was just the mentality of getting it. But I was very fine until I went to test, you know, you start to, oh my God. So normally during the day, I'll be able to work, uh, spend a lot of time writing and stuff. Then by five o'clock, I'll be feeling a bit feverish. I'll just go to bed, but I'll be able to wake up five o'clock, go to bed, wake up like nine o'clock the next day. You know, and I will still work till four o'clock. I'm, I'll, I'll be feeling feverish. Then I'll go and sleep yep. again. So it continued for like four or five days. But that was it, really. It was, I'll just drink some coffee, uh, some tea and stuff. Yeah, it worked. No, I, I was lucky. I was, I was quite lucky. But yeah, over time, well, give thanks, give thanks, man. Over time, over here, it's become so common, you know. Almost everybody I know has one test. <laughs> there was a there was a lady on my show. I don't know if it was episode sixty one. It's called Living with COVID because it's gonna be you know it's gonna get to a stage where it's almost like a common cold. I think I think everybody's gonna get it. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. And um, and now we're talking about achieving herd immunity, not through vaccination, but through infection. Yeah, so that's incredible. Yeah, I've had all my all my three jobs now, so I wouldn't mind getting a fourth. <laughs> I definitely take a fourth, but as soon as I'm ready, I'll take it. I'll take it again. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's also it's also the social responsible thing to do. I oh, think absolutely. it gives you some yeah. of mind going to bed. You know. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's yes. a social responsible thing to do. A bit of that confidence. Well, you know, David, tell you what, we've touched on so many things. We've actually managed mm. to catch up, yes, oh, yes, on all this time over the years <laughs> and still touch on the topic in a very deep way, in a deeper way than I actually expected. I mean, you have so I am um, after 20 I'm, years, you, you still look very young, very young, you know. I've, I've grown very old. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me that I look young. You know, listen, man. I, so I've gotten to the age where you think you have to tell me that I look young. <laughs> no, 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 no. You've you, you managed to really, you know, you still really the end, you know. But, um, Thanks. Yeah. You, you, you Thanks, have, well, you've, you've, you've looked after yourself very well. Well, you know, I, I, how do I, say? let me tell you, it's still very challenging, you know, there, there are still problems. And I mean, as I said, I have no regrets, but you know, things are not exactly the way I want them to be yet. I chose to be self-employed. So, you know, I, I, you know, in Germany, you know, when you finish studying, you have to either find a job or make a job. And I've decided to make a job for myself. And uh, that's a very stressful existence. And coupled with all some of the things we also talked about and so on, mm. it's not so easy. But you know, as I said, you know, I am surrounded. I surround myself with good people. Um, I, I I choose my surroundings and my spheres of influence and so on, and I know how to not take on everything. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know what I mean. Um, I do a little bit of sports. You know, I do some push-ups. I have a cat. You know, she loves me dearly, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, man. yeah I remember I'm creative. I, I try to be creative as well. I remember you know, you, art. You registered for the gym, which was in the building. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I had to do that. Uh, I've never been to a gym, you know. That's why I'm, uh, I've developed a pot belly and big head. I also have one. But, you know, <laughs> I, we were talking about it this evening, you know, my plout. So we call it a plout in <laughs> Germany. Yes. It makes me feel like a normal person. So, you know, I, I, I don't need to look beautiful all the time and cause people to feel insecure. I want people to feel secure around me. So, you know, I sport a plout. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's, it's fine. When was the last time you spoke to Ike? You remember Ike? Ike. Yes, I remember my dad. <laughs> Very long. That's since Frankfurt. Order. Is he still in? Where is he now? He was back in Germany the last time I spoke to him. You know, he really? from Frankfurt, Uda, he went to Ireland. Yes, that I remember. With masters. Mm -hmm. Then he first came to me in the UK, uh, then went back, then went to Ireland. Then he got lost for, four, for almost four years. We were looking for him until one day he popped up. He was in the seminary in Italy training to be a priest. 
Oh yes, yes, yes. He was very religious. Yes, I remember. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was training to be a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. Then I thought he had passed out. Then he got lost again. Then he popped up last year. He didn't finish the training. There was problems. So he left the seminary. And he's come to Germany. He first went to Switzerland to another school. Uh, the, still on the Catholic theology. Then he's come back to Germany. He was doing uh, a master's, uh, a master of philosophy around theology in what, you know, that Catholic University of, was it at Ingolstadt or something? It's, it's down could down. be, could be, could be Ingolstadt, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where he was. So that was the last time I spoke to him. Then uh, he moved the girl, uh, Ike. So Ike is still kind of doing the school stuff. Eh? Uh, yeah, he he wanted to be a priest. Yes, I remember. He was very, very religious. Yeah, like me. Um well, you know, I mean, I I have the greatest respect for for religion, you know, mm. and 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 so on. You know, I mean, I I am not. I believe that there must be something greater than I. <laughs> there is, but but I do I do you know, but um I I don't think, for example, I don't think um the god the god that is can be offended by me or needs anything from me. To be honest, yeah, there is. There. Uh, so I'm thankful. I'm thankful and respectful. The but great, you know, the great architect of the universe. Yeah, I don't think this this architect, he or she or it, needs me for anything. I don't think I can <laughs> insult this thing. Yes, I don't think I can insult this thing at all. You know, so I'm just respectful. You know, oh, and I'm mindful. You, know, you have become but, a very German man. Eh? No, 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 I'm still very spiritual, you know. I pray before I eat. Very shortly. Yes, of course, of course, of course, of course. And I mean, there are things, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I believe in, in, in intelligent design somehow. And, and, and I don't think there is a country. I don't think there is a. A, a, a contradiction between, for example, evolution and creation. I just think that the seven days, what we call seven days, is probably seven million years. Mm. You know, because what is a day to God? You know, mm -hmm. um, so so it's not really two schools of thought. It's just two groups of people who are running politics. You know, <laughs> that's that's all. You know, it's one truth. I think, and and you know, there is God is love. You know, that God is love. I think God is love. Thank God is love. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 all there is. There's a lot of politics that we create though around the idea of God because mm -hmm. all of us have that need for the divine. Yes, somehow. Many of us have that. And 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 because anywhere you see a need, you know, mm -hmm. there's gonna be lots of cash money or lots of insurance or lots of taxes or lots of you know business and politics. And these, the, but these are things we create between ourselves mm -hmm. and the divine mm -hmm. yes right. we create all these things yes he is the divine creator yes 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 yeah we try to you know put our um agencies in between and agents <laughs> mm. yeah that's that's how i see it it's not easy yeah. oh, it's good, it's good. i actually yeah. spoke to shingai also recently she, I think she had like about two kids now, no? Or yes, I think yes, three yes, yes. now. Oh, two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. three, isn't it? I think we touched base once. Uh, the last time I saw her, she was um, she, uh, what a director of some kind of cricket sports board or something. Yeah, she used to be the marketing director for the Zimbabwe Cricket Club. Uh, yes. yes, 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 the yes, yes, and she had started a podcast, I think, as well. Yeah, then she moved. Yes. To, she moved to join um, uh, British Imperial Tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh yes, I remember that yeah, as well. Yes, American Tobacco. Yeah, then mm -hmm. uh, then she moved again. Uh, she went mm -hmm. to a bank. Mm -hmm. Then she went to a bank, and now mm -hmm. she's doing some stuff on her own and stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, well, she, she appears to be as dynamic, as, as dynamic and inspired and driven as she has always been. It's a tough girl. Yes, yes. I say it's a tough, tough girl. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed, indeed. I think we're still connected on Facebook, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, well, David. Yeah, my lord. We have had a show, <laughs> an episode. This is gonna be hard for me to edit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all right. Yeah. Because it's, right. it's all mixed up. Yeah, yeah with uh That's catching right. up if, and if, so on. If you were to put it all out, man, people mm-hmm. would really enjoy it. This is a real kind of thing. Yes, we have it. Yes. Class. <laughs> yes it's true it's true yeah but... and i should probably stay true to my word and say you know one time i said you know i was talking to my first university in jamaica um i had i had a the, the director of arts and culture was on a show once yeah and and i said to him that if i make a show for seven minutes it's seven minutes if i make a show for three hours it's three hours you know and anybody who doesn't know what's good it's their problem <laughs> That's yeah. what I said to him. So know. maybe I stayed true to these words and yeah. and published the show in full length. And I remember you did you did quantity survey at the university. Say again? Yes, 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 I yeah. did that quantity before survey. before I came here. Yes. yes. I, I never forget anything, you know. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that you'd forget some of it. I was hoping. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, whenever you come over back to Berlin, I'm still in Berlin. Sure, sure. I've been, I've been in, there in twice. I've been there yeah. twice, but uh, one of was the Compass Project. Then I came on holiday with the family. That, mm-hmm. I went to show them Frankfurt Oda and stuff. You went to Frankfurt Oda? Yeah, with my wife and the kids. Uh, we went uh-huh. to the pizza. We went uh-huh. to the accommodation where I used to stay, and I was showing them around. Do you remember the do you remember the day when me and you and Ike went to the Polish embassy to get a get visa? Get a visa. <laughs> and our train and, was and, out. And, and, <laughs> and the guy, no, the guy, we were waiting in the cold, mm-hmm. like at for five in the morning. And then the guy came out and said, "You and I can go in, but I have to wait longer outside because I am Rastafari." <laughs> he said that to me, yes, and he left me out there, and and I had to wait much longer, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. He said, no, you have to wait. You are Rastafari, you know? And the one I can really recollect is when uh, we were on the train. We had gone to get a visa. And when we in the train go to, I think, somewhere around Foster Valley Spree or somewhere. And they just stopped. And we were in the train. Then all of a sudden, we had the police entering the train. And straight, they came to me and you. You remember this? And they came to us at four twice. Ah, <laughs> yes, 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 of course, of course, yeah, yeah. As well, that has happened a few times. <laughs> that, that was an interesting one, you know, the train just stopped. Nobody mm-hmm. was coming in, we're just sitting in there, the, the policeman in there. Uh, oh, it's better. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah, oh man, you know. I have my, yeah. I have my, pa- oh, this camera is not working, I've got my, my passport here, the passport I was using in there. And sometimes I pick it up and I just laugh. You know, you, you look at the stamps. When I was No, but mine as well, yeah. Because I was living on the Polish border, closer to the Polish border than you. And to go over the bridge, they would stop me. Right? And they have to check everywhere, you know. They call everywhere and they give me a stamp. And sometimes the friends just want to buy cherries. Some want to buy vodka or cigarettes. But I just wanted to buy cherries or maybe a schnitzel. And they would stop me there and I'd be waiting for them to make their checks. Right? And still waiting when my friends came back from shopping. Yes? And all my passport full of... of of stamps for Poland, you know. And, you know, to be honest, I didn't even like Poland, you know. At the time, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to buy cherries over there. Yeah. You know? And it's such a joke. I still have, I still have the passport full of stamps, you know. But I suspect <laughs> that they never, they never really had anything to do. It was. I think so. The, yeah. the Germans were really nice to me when I get. The Germans there. were okay, but the Polish guys were. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 are you sure you just want to buy cherries? Are you sure? <laughs> it's, it's very funny, you know. Some of these things, they are doing that. It's just because they've not seen one of those passports before. And it's someone else. 
Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of you course. Know, this is no, that's not personal. Pass when they will pass it round. You know, money. Mm -hmm. It's they're not really checking anything. They are just they just never touch uh, an African. You know, kind of touch a Jamaican passport. Mm -hmm. Where in this mm -hmm. world are you going to touch a Jamaican passport on that border? Yes. You came here for cherries. I cannot believe it. <laughs> you must be a spy. <laughs> Incredible, you know. You you walking in me going to Poland, coming and I'm a hungry man, you know, having my problem to do what you are thinking. And you can imagine someone else is looking at you, thinking you've got something under your sleeves, and you've got absolutely not. You are you are just like a fly, you know, mm -hmm. walking around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those kind of conspiracies were quite rife in the east isn't it you know you know i think still i don't know but you know i still suspect that probably probably i'm being watched <laughs> i don't know i don't know you know sometimes you know it's, you know, it's flattering man yeah. i mean i have a show you know I, i'm a showman yeah so if they want to watch it's fine i've been going to russia regularly because I'm, I'm a, yes i noticed i noticed what's, what's it? so ah. in moscow and, nice. Uh, yeah, actually, it was a German guy who recruited me. Um, mm -hmm. um, he, his wife is from Eisenhüttenstadt. Mm. So we met at a conference, and I said, oh, I lived in Frankfurt. And that is how we became very good friends. Okay. Um, yeah, they put me on the uh, uh, National Research Program, basic research. So I've been going there regularly. And one of my friends said, ooh. Are you sure, David, you are not being watched? You know? I said, come on. Well, of, of course you are. No, I don't think. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, in Look, man, in England, it's, it's, it's no. flattering, isn't it? <laughs> it is. But in England, who, who watch you? It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. But you have the most cameras in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they yes. know. I'm sure the British government knows. I, I've got absolutely nothing here. You are, mm -hmm. you, come on, you. No, nah, the UK would they do that, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it, it's flattering. It's flattering. Yeah, it's it's flattering, you know? So it, it's fine, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, yeah, I want people to watch my show. So if you don't want to watch another show, then it's fine. <laughs> how, how do I publicize your show? How do I do it? I have to. <laughs> do I have to just put well, it on my YouTube or something? Uh, my, how do you call it? Well, it, it is it is everywhere, you know. I mean, it, it's an audio podcast, mm -hmm. and um, there are many topics there, mm -hmm. uh, mostly connected somehow to adult learning. Sometimes languages, but we talk about real things. Like the last episode, I'll just send you the link. It's everywhere. If you go to any podcast player, any internet radio, and just search for English Coach Podcast, you'll see it. And you get lots of uh, downloads. Do you get the full release? Yes, yes, yes. I get, um, let's see, the downloads for this month, for the first time, I got to 2,000 downloads a month. Ooh, that's good. And, and um, you know, the, the, the target somehow like, you know, some kind of um, holy grail is 3,000 downloads a month. But it's been going up. Oh, and uh, the, the listeners are Germany. The most listeners are from Germany, US, and the UK for some strange reason. Oh. And India. Oh, that's good. And India, you know. That's good. That's yeah. good. So, so it's it's it's, it's sister, growing. I remember you had a sister in the UK. She's still she's still there. Mm. In she's Bristol, still there. In Bristol, isn't so, it? No, she's somewhere in Kent. Somewhere in Kent. She was in a place called Maidstone. Yeah, Maidstone. Okay. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah, and but um, by this time you you visited. Uh, yes, of course. She has. Yeah, she has. Um, two kids now you know bought a house and is married and so on yeah that's nice. yeah, yeah yes absolutely. very expensive place kent is a, kent is a yeah. crazy place it's just the, the house the garden the house price <laughs> there is ridiculous yeah bristol yeah. is uh, it's also getting out of hand here but it's, it's okay mm -hmm. but london is just a mad place you know? the, yes the house price yes of course it's just mm -hmm. Uh, people, people, people have been, you know, it's just, they, 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 they live to work, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, or how do you call it? They, they work to live. <laughs> they live to work or work to live. Yeah. They work to live. Big difference, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's quite tough. 
very tough. Mm. Well, you know, one day, one day, I'll definitely come back to visit. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I don't know when. It's very complicated. If you, now. If, you, if you come again, let me know. I will, I, I will chill you till you drop dead. I will be honored. You know, I'd love to. <laughs> I'd love to to visit visit, yeah. visit visit. I would like to experience all your faculties. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the places oh, they reside. Oh, 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 I'll make you stay with me at Bristol. You will love it. Yes, yes. You will yes, love yes, yes. you of Bristol. You know? Yeah, probably, probably, probably. I, I, I try again. You know, I mean, I was a little disappointed, a little, you know, with uh, Brexit. You know. Yeah, it's it's a shame, really. Um, I, I took it personally. I thought it was a bluff. All of us. You know. All of us. I thought I thought it was a bluff, and then all of a sudden, what? Yeah, it was incredible. Um, some of us, it was it was very painful, but uh, hey, we 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 getting used to it now. Um. Well, that is that is that is the United Kingdom for you. Um, um, we were worried, but most of us were not really worried. I have never been worried because I know this country uh, will find a way out. You, you know, <laughs> it, it, it is Great Britain. Yeah, we are Great Britain. You know, <laughs> no matter how difficult. We, what do you you mean find you mean find a way in? What what I don't understand. What what? No, I mean, not, <laughs> not to get back in the European Union or whatever. Okay. But when you, you you think about the the how do you call it um, the impact on, on 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 our economy and and the impact on our livelihoods and you know the disruption and you you, you would think oh these people cannot even survive, but. Uh, that's why I said um, I, I believe in Great Britain, and we, we have done successfully well, and we will we will actually do the best, get the best out of it. Uh, this is the United Kingdom. We are the the, the beauty here. It, it's it just doesn't work. Our mentality and the kind of model of capitalism we run, and you know the, the way things run here is just. It, it, it just antithetical to the European model. <laughs> you know? Our model is just crazy, uh, but we love it, and uh, um, yeah, we 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 survive, and we, we will survive. We, and trust the British people. Um, you know we are out. We know we are out, and we know very well that it is no good for us. And when we know very well it is no good for us. No, he will tell you what well, the electorate said. We should come out. Yeah, we are out. Then we will come back and sign a contract, you know, and 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 as a not joining, you know, but put in place all kind of arrangements you now which will help mm. these things. Even though we know it will not be the best, uh, but look, if the electorate is saying this is what you want, you, you give them that. Because when they come to you, say yeah. So for example, people thought, oh. When we come out, we will not be able to travel to Europe. And I, I kept telling people, no, forget it. We will have our 90-day travel. That is automatic. It's, it's just, it, it will happen. Um, mm -hmm. we, we talk about the fact that we will need a work permit. When I, yes. I want to come to Germany now, we say, yes, mm -hmm. we know, but come on. The British coming to Germany. The only difference is that now I may potentially need to get a job before uh, they will give me the work permit or whatever, yeah, whatever process. But it will be as easy as it's also just like a German coming here. No, mm -hmm. in the Italian, it's still it's still so easy. Any German comes here tomorrow morning, whatever you want, we will give it to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So I I know what you mean. I the know whole Brexit, the whole Brexit stuff, to some extent, is just a name. It's it's just a totally different relationship. We are cosmetic. Having. And it's cosmetic. Yes. It's just. It's just, you'll be shocked. In the next five years, we will be signing deals like Switzerland and we'll be paying into the European Union. And and we will not be getting what we would have gotten actually when we were in there, but we'll be paying all those money and get the bit that we get. And we tell them that, yes, we are still not in the European Union. <laughs> well, that's, that's, why, that's why I said a way in. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it will. And, and and the Europeans know our contribution to the European project. Um, they, they 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 like the, the British people. Our our sense of craziness and the kind of stuff we can do and our our, 
our, our streak of innovations. And, you know, it, it's a shame, really. We, we used to be a very powerful country in the European Union, and we've lost that clout, which is, which is a shame. Um, but uh, we are now touting what we call Global Britain. <laughs> yeah, so there's a little nostalgia there, no? Yeah, 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 yeah. global. Mm. Uh, we, we, we are. Yes, yes. Yeah, cool. Yes. Well, you know, as a. <laughs> Yes, yes. I'm still a little bit disappointed, but uh, and I, I agree with you. There will be definitely a, a new way in, I think. No, yes. we, we are all disappointed. And, and let me tell you, even the people who who were leading the chat, the Brexit project, Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson doesn't believe in Brexit. Everybody knows it. It was just for political expediency. It was just a, pop, 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 a populist moment. Yes. yes. And that moment, that moment, the last show I did was on moment. Mm. Yes. And it's just, it's just a moment that took the world, you yeah. know. It started with, uh, you know, so somehow with Obama and then yeah. and there was this right wing movement mm -hmm. that just took the world. I think the terrorist waves had a lot to do with it as well. And that started with the refugee crisis from Syria. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's kind of like a natural process, a yeah. uh, resistance, you know, a right-wing um, retreat taken by a lot of countries, Brazil, Austria, mm. Poland, Germany in yeah. some ways, uh, Great uh, Britain, America, a lot of them, you yeah. know. Hungary. So it was a populist moment, you know. It's, it's, it's but a sad. I was hoping, you know, you can imagine now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, I would have probably come to Frankfurt or there and buy a house there. You know, so buy some cheap house, you know, every year or something, just come and chill or go to Poland, you know, buy some cheap house, you know, the twin. And I'm afraid we've, we've lost all those opportunities. And uh, the people, you know, the, the older people and stuff, they still have all those properties and stuff in, in Spain and all those places. But those of us coming up now, all those kind of fantastic opportunities that I, I could just walk into uh, Latvia, Latvia and start some, you know, crazy consultancy business the next morning. Uh, we've lost, we've lost all. Yeah, if I go now, they will allow you to do whatever you want to do, but you still have to go through all those kind of bottlenecks and you know, difficult administrative procedures, and which is a shame. Whereas before that, I land, I land today, the next morning I can be buying and selling and doing whatever I want. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pain. It's, it's a real pain. It's a, it's, it's a real pain. It's, it's, it's just us, but... Yeah, we feel and the and, and the colonies. But yeah, all right, tell you what, um, David, this is gonna be another show, okay? Yeah. <laughs> we have to, we have to, we have to kind of close off now. Sure. Yes, sure. Sure. yes. Otherwise, my computer is gonna explode with um, <laughs> with all this, all this, this, this um conversations. Yeah, but you know what? Thank you for making the effort. I was distraught yesterday. I had a small crisis because no, I wasn't no. sure what happened. No, that's fine. And um, and I really appreciate the fact that you made the effort and and made this happen. No, no, no. Okay, it on. really means a lot to me. Come on, and it means a lot to me. Catching up with you and uh, it's exciting. It's, it's interesting and uh, it's great, great, great. I'm looking forward to to see you in person one of these days. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. That, that that will happen, man. Yeah, will when, happen. when you, you, you come to the UK. Yes, 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 mm. yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks for giving me another reason to to try again. <laughs> <laughs> you need a visa to come to the UK, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It's it's rough, you know. It's, it's rough. rough. But have you got a German passport now or you don't want to take it? No. Why? I'm Jamaican. Why don't you take it? You should take one. But you still maintain your Jamaican yeah, identity. And Jamaican the, the, the thing is this, you know, to be honest, David, no disrespect, but I like being Jamaican, man. I like it. And um, I think by now I could. You brought everything to apply. If you apply to, today, tomorrow morning, they will bring you your passport. You know, as I, yeah, yeah. As I, again, I think during the time when I was actually, actually started the process, but I stopped it because that same wave, this populist wave that took the world about started about three, four, five years ago, 
it was happening. And where you really feel that is in the administrative spaces. That's where you feel that. That's where it touches you. So I just stopped. Oh, but please, please get revive it, get it done. It's it's just, why it's just <laughs> why no, it's just it just it just gives you a bit of um freedom, additional freedom as in movements and getting things done, and you you don't have to carry it when you need it. You you just use it. And why well, I mm. I took a British passport so twelve years ago. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, listen, it's fine. It's fine. You know, and I'm also encouraged to do that as well. Yeah. Um, I have considered it and so on. But, you know, to be, to be perfectly honest, as I said, you know, I don't mind being Jamaican. Anybody who wants to give me trouble to come into their country, they don't need my money. Nah. It's that simple. <laughs> it's that simple, you know. No, and I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, it, it said it on the last show as well, last interview. You know, I mean, we need to get out of this mm. oppression, this visa oppression. Yeah, it's not. It's, not, it's, it's big it's business, not, you know, it's big business. It is, it's not a trouble. It's just. It, it, it just gives you, I, I call it additional options, you know? Yes, it does. It yes, does. it does. But, you know, I mean, options can also be a torture, you know? <laughs> yes. I mean, I have one cat in my house. Can you imagine if I had two? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, please get one. Get, get it. <laughs> it would you, kill me in my sleep. You, you deserve one, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, mm. very upset. Like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. As I said, you know, it was just the, the, at, at that moment when I had started it. It was, it, it wasn't right. The vibe wasn't right. And and I said, you know, this this wave that took the world, where you feel it, is is you heard you feel it. You hear it on the news. You might see it on the street. But where you really feel it is in the administrative offices but when because you put that's, that's where, they'll be that's where shocked. the government touches people, yes? They'll be shocked, isn't it? To see somebody living in Germany for almost 20 years now speaks mm -hmm. good German, you know, mm -hmm. and in German, done everything. They will ask yeah, look you, here, man, you know, I'm a Jamaican, yeah? Yeah, they will say, oh. <laughs> yeah, you see, yeah, look, it's it's okay. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's not, uh, you know, I don't really have to put this to the scrutiny and device of mass public media. But I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm Jamaican, man. When, when, and when, when, when the time comes, it will, and maybe it won't. No. When when you get it and they ask you on Gabustot, then you put Frankfurt Uda. Gabustot, Frankfurt Uda. Yes. Yeah, when I yes, meet, yes, I yes. say they everyone. I tell them I'm from Frankfurt Huda, so <laughs> Yeah. From BB right. Radio, you know. You remember that radio? Yes, look, look. Yay. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Of course I remember the radio. Yeah, BB Radio and uh, Beef Wolf, Beef mm -hmm. and uh, Bananas. I remember bananas, yes, the yes, yes. The grotta. The grotta. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, those days were good, man. It's a... Yes, 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 yes. I remember. I remember <laughs> the bar called Tsuka. Yeah, Tsuka. <laughs> mm -hmm. And your and your heavy waist, you know. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. That was um that was that was an experience, I tell you. Uh, it's oh, probably man. close now, isn't it? It'll be close. Longer. I think I think it's closed because um they they were getting some flack for you know being such a a hot location in front of the the seat of knowledge the universe the library. Right. I don't know if 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 they're still there. <laughs> yeah, oh, I mean God. it was it was in the middle of the universe yeah, you know, yeah. cocktail <laughs> bar. So I, I don't know I don't know I just got a feeling I don't know anything but you know no 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 it should be gone now it's, it's probably been turned into something else now twenty yeah years. no those businesses yeah, yeah, those yeah. businesses don't run for too long yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 they're pretty pretty it's hard business yeah oh man all right all right yeah have a good Meister have you good. too and thanks again thanks again it, it was a real pleasure David yeah. and um. I will let you know. I think the the posting of this is going to be episode 65 and I just posted 63. So it's actually every two weeks that I post one. So sure. this might be out in about a month, sure. actually. I'm going to take a walk a bit and then I'll come back to continue my work. Thanks again. Yeah.
Right, okay. Okay, bye. Bye. With a small win, it's always a good way to begin. Feel free to check out the show notes for this episode at www.trainingtree.de slash podcast or englishcoachpodcast.com. Again, like it if you like it, and if you don't, lie to me. Just kidding, but still... Give meaning to the things you think about the show by using the feedback link to tell me personally what you think. This will help it to help you as it's intended to do. Thanks for listening. Looking forward to hearing from you and bye for now.